last Saturday. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah, it's been 12 weeks. <laughs> last one. I'll give you your Saturday back. <laughs> I actually really enjoyed it. I really I find the class so interesting and I, I really like it. It's been a great class for teachers. So. Thank you. Hello. All right. Hi, I'll make you guys co-hosts. Uh, I'll pin both. For whatever of you. reason, when we switch, he, I'm really small. So yeah, I was just gonna double check. Yeah. That I'm I'll spotlight too. I think it's if you spotlight. Yeah. Okay. Spotlight too when I switch with you just to help out if they're oh, that yeah so I'll add both of you on to spotlight and then okay. that should be all right awesome I guess we'll wait a few minutes for everybody to join Okay, so people are coming in now, so we'll wait another minute. Uh, Professor, can I ask a question regarding the uh, internship? Um, oh, uh, well, that, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email you the, the, my, my hours in, in a bit. But I uh, know the, um, I want to call the, the hands on project. Uh huh. Um, there were some things I couldn't find on the router that, uh, that I chose, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you couldn't find it, possibly they don't have that feature. So just put down that you couldn't find it. Um, oh, okay. I, I realized that the firewall, the uh, TP600, they, they removed the demo for that. So I rewrote the instruction for another model. But um, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, if you can't, yeah, if you can't find what, some of the things, then that's okay. Because all of them are slightly different. Um, as some of them won't have some of the features. But in general, you would, you would have to you would have all the filter that you need. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go back and check that then, because uh, yeah, cause I, I couldn't find that, that model, but I, was, I didn't realize that you chose a different one. So uh, I ended up picking the TZ270W. Uh, yeah, uh, that's fine. Oh, that's fine? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose in that is to let you guys kind of see how firewall would interface would look, right? How it would look like and to introduce you to some of the firewall feature. Nilsson is actually the one that pointed out to me that they took off the, the TP600C. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this is our last Saturday together. You guys made it. For those of you who went through all the three classes, congratulations. After this, you earned a certificate. Um, if you didn't get through all the classes and you wanted to take the other two to get your certificate, I think we likely will run that after the spring. Um, so we will also have other non-credit courses in the summer. Um, I don't know how COVID-19 is gonna look. We'll have to see uh, semester to semester. I hope to offer some of the other courses that will have more hardware hands-on um, in person, but you know, with limitation, we'll have to make do. So um, 
if you're interested in other opportunities like apprenticeship and things like that, make sure you shoot me an email. Um, I will share with you apprenticeship information if you haven't gotten that. Okay. All right. So um, this week we are going to talk about cryptography. I'm going to start screen share. And um, you can find your assignments and notes on Canvas. Um, so the last session, I wanted to <laughs> reduce the work a little bit. Um, as you know that we have to close the course on Tuesday, 11.59 p.m. Um, make sure that you get all your work submitted by then. Uh, we do have a very short lab. I want to introduce you to Open PGP, and I'll talk about that. It doesn't take very long to go through the website. Um, instead of using Practice Lab, I want to share with you some of the email encryption since we're going to talk about cryptography. Now, if you look at the book that um, the optional book that I'm using for this course, this comes out of chapter nine and ten. I did skip some of the chapters only because it kind of covers some of the things we were talking about and the security policies and stuff. Um, that's kind of, you know, a little bit more on the administrative side. So I wanted to touch on the technical side this week. Um, and if you are studying for Security Plus certification, they are releasing a new version. The 601 is coming in January, I believe. So they're gonna uh, retire the 501. Now you can still study the materials for the 501. Um, it will have some of the questions from there, but they're gonna add new questions as technology has changed. So um, if you downloaded the notes and the assignments, we'll go through that together. Okay. okay. So um, this week, we're going to talk about cryptography and insecurity cryptography or encryption is a very important topic. We use encryption in everything from the time that you're using your smartphone to access um, different websites or the time that we are um, using certain uh, web resources or even when we send email, we can encrypt that. Now in security, you know that we have three main focus, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, and we touch on that earlier this semester or earlier in this course. So encryption is gonna give us the confidentiality and integrity it also gives us non-repudiation, um, which is the fourth element in the security. Um, it's not completely essential, but it is um, recommended that we have some form of way to track and hold the user accountable. So encryption is implemented using algorithm. And sometimes you would see mathematical formula um, being added to the source code. So that way it would convert your plain text message into something that's not readable. Now we would use encryption for web traffic. So when you're using HTTPS to log into a website like a bank or you're authenticating to your social network or even on Google when you're accessing your email, you're using some form of encryption there, okay? Now encryption gives us integrity in that. It, it gives you assurance that the data has not been modified. So if I'm sending you data and I encrypt it, right? If somebody trying to intercept it and if I'm using a good encryption, um, the person who intercepts it hopefully won't be able to decrypt it or read it, right? And uh, businesses, they would use this to transfer data back and forth within their organization 
or to their partner or a third party. So for example, if somebody is wiring money from United States to oversee, right? That information is being sent from one bank to another bank um, as a transaction and it needs to be encrypted. So we have to have some way to make sure that it provides integrity, meaning that the data hasn't changed from you or the sender to the destination, the receiver. Um, and the way that we implement hash in encryption is that hash is just a numerical value. It could be in, usually it's in hexadecimal um, and there are different type of hash. That hash is a calculation of that data. So let's say that I have a piece of data that's giving me a value of six, for example, and I'm sending it to my friend. And when my friend receives it, right, the system can check the hash value. It needs to verify that it's also six in order to make sure that it's in its entirety. Now, if somebody intercepts it in the middle and change that data, and let's say that they would inject something into the packet or modify the data somehow, my friend, when this person receives the data, the hash value will also be modified. It will not be six, it would be something else. So when you're looking at a hash value, usually it's a long string of numerical and alphabetical character. As most of the hash, what we see on the interface would be in hexadecimal, right? Which is zero through nine and A through F. So this is why you would see that hash is equipped with encryption in such that we want to protect the entirety of the data. Now, the second piece to the encryption is confidentiality, right? So it makes sure that it's intended for a specific user. So if you're trying to connect to the bank to access your bank account, right? The destination will be the bank. You're submitting that request and the the servers is going to serve you the information about your bank account. So it needs to respond back where when you obtain, when your system get that data, it needs to make sure that it's intended for you. So this is going to be viewable for the authorized user. So often you would see encryption have some form of authentication, right, to verify. And at the simplest level, you would see that it would be username and password or passphrase or some kind of security token. So when we say security token means it can contain the credential of the user, right? Who they are, what they're capable of doing, what kind of privilege they have or what kind of access permission they have in that system. Okay, so encryption protects the confidentiality of the data. Now, when you're looking at the first question, we want to reiterate that. So we want to describe how encryption is used to provide confidentiality and integrity. So we mentioned that integrity provides to make sure that the data hasn't been changed, right? From the time that it's sent to the time that it's received or during the transferring process. So some people, they would encrypt their data when they put it on an external hard drive or USB. Let's say that you have very important documents in your family, like birth certificate, uh, marriage license, stuff like that, and you scan it, what you can do is you can encrypt those files. Hold on one second.
Sorry, my dog is just keep barking. Okay. So you can encrypt your important data once you put it on like a backup storage. Okay. Like sometimes you would have network attached storage or um, let's say that I wanted to back it up and put it on an external hard drive. Now, if you're using Windows, you can use a tool, right? Like BitLocker and BitLocker is used to encrypt uh, a storage device, okay? Now, the way BitLocker works is that you can generate the key, right? And that can be uh, uh, in numerical and letters value. You can save that key somewhere or you can print out that key. So in, in case you need to unlock it, like a safe, right? You have a combination of the safe. So the same thing, you would have that key to, in order to unlock it. So BitLocker is designed specifically to encrypt data on drives or storage device. Now, the way Windows work is that you can encrypt files and folders, right? Um, and, and the way that we would see this, so let me show you, okay? So let's say that I go to the properties of a folder. Um, in the advanced option, right? Um, if you're using a specific versions or a spe if you formatted uh, your drive and when you install Windows, right? Let's say that I use uh, Windows 10 Pro um, you can either compress or you can encrypt. So once you check the encrypted content of the secure data, if you encrypt a folder, what it will do is it will encrypt every single file within. So let's say that I would throw the data onto my USB. I would copy it and paste it onto my USB. I can encrypt individual file or I can encrypt the entire folder. So if you don't want people to see, right? Let's say that if you lose the USB, um, in order to open up that folder or that the files in a certain folder that's encrypted, right? They have to have a proper key. And the way it works is that once you have it encrypted as that user, it would have that information of that user that would correlate with how the user accessing that data, the files or the folder. So the encryption option is here and that's in the property, right? Of the folder, okay? And at the advanced option in the windows. Now every system would be slightly different, of course, right? Different OSs would use different tools. However, in general, if we see business using Microsoft, they can encrypt the files and folder, right? Using the file encryption, the file system encryption, or if they wanted to put it onto a storage for Microsoft, then they can use BitLocker. Now, confidentiality, we talk about how it's intended for specific users and it would protect the confidentiality of the data. Earlier, I mentioned that there's non-repudiation, right? So when you encrypt the data, what it will do is it will generate a timestamp. Uh, it would say at this time on this day, right? This individual encrypt this data. And so that way it validates who is committed to that action, what kind of accountability right, that will relate to that data in that system. And so in the case where if we're looking at, you know, the logs in security, we would say, okay, the encryption was generated at this time, the key was issued at this time, and this is where the key would be, okay? So now um, in the Windows environment, once a user encrypts, the data, right? It's not readable to other user in exception of the administrator. So the highest level user is the administrator, as you know. So the administrator would be able to have access to the key 
in case the other user is not present or sometime they could be locked out of their account, right? Let's say in a business that user moved on to a different job, right? And they encrypted certain files for that company. Well, the system administrator can go in and decrypt because the system also generate a copy of that key for the administrator uh, level user. Okay, do you have any questions so far? So there are variations in how we would use our keys, right? So for number one, you would see that in the first part on page one. So there are two types of encryption. There's the symmetric encryption and there's asymmetric encryption. So for symmetric encryption, you would use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. And you often see this for a web environment because that way it would be faster, right? We want performance, we want speed. So we wanted to use the same key. Now, would this be the best option? Not necessarily, right? But we would weight the risk by for the performance or you know faster access quicker response quicker to decrypt so there are many different types of encryption that will fall fall into this category symmetric key now the asymmetric encryption it uses two keys a public and a private key so this is what we call a key pair, right? Now, um, in order to receive the key, they have to receive a certificate. So let's say you have two user, user A and user B, and they want to encrypt files or messages to send to each other using asymmetric encryption. Then those users, once they authenticate, that credential would be tied to a certificate. And that certificate would be used to generate the key. So it's like this, right? My analogy is, let's say that you go to a theme park like Disneyland with your family and you walk up to the window and you pay for a ticket, okay? And they would take your money, give you a ticket once you get that ticket, you would enter the gate, right? And at that gate, they would scan your ticket, right? So at that point, that would be a certificate. It says, okay, you have access, right, to the gate to obtain the key, right, or to obtain entrance to the amusement park. Then, once they scan your ticket, they give you a band for your wrist, your wristband, right? Then at that point, that key would be given to you. So now with, this, with the wristband, you will be able to access any part of Disneyland, right? Or well, for most part of Disneyland anyway. So in that process, what you see is that it issue what's called a certificate and based on that certificate, it would generate a key. And so here it says that anything that's encrypted with the public key, it needs to have a private key to decrypt. Anything that's encrypted with the private key, it needs to be using a public key to decrypt. So let's say that somebody is capturing one of the keys what will happen is they cannot decrypt the message. Let's say that I, I stole a private key from that user and that private key is used to encrypt. I cannot decrypt the message because I don't have a matching public key, okay? So they need to match and they have to be used together, okay? Now, um, so in the, let's 
let's wait for the hash. In the ciphering or encryption, you also have different categories of encryption. You have streaming cipher, which is one, one bit at a time. And then you have block cipher, which is encrypt data in blocks. And sometimes you will hear like blockchain um, and cryptocurrency, stuff like that, right? So encryption is used for cryptocurrency as the name crypto, right? Um, and they would use blockchain technology where it would chunk the data into blocks or a big chunk, right? It would section it into big chunks. And what it will do is it would use, right, specific bits from each of the chunk with a logical operator, right, to link one chunk with the next. So let's think about like a train, right? You have all of these cars, all of these, right, cargos that's connected onto the train. It's very much like that. So how does it know, right, which is which, right? It's using specific bits to really identify the block, right? The sequence of that block and how it's linked together. And also when it's decrypting, it's decrypting in chunks, not in the entirety. So kind of like the domino effect in a way, but it's using the logical from the first block to open the next block to open the next block. Now, is that efficient? Uh, not necessarily, it will be slow, right? Let's think about it. If you have 25 boxes to open in order to open the second box, you first have to open the first box, get the key, right? Or have some way to link the key to open the next box and then from the second box, you would be able to open the third box and so forth. Well, that would slow down the process. However, it would be safer. So we give up time for the protection of the data, right? So I, I pretty much summarize it. There's a lot more to blockchain, but um, that's kind of like an analogy that you can think about when, when you see these things is that you know, specific things are linked together and in order to decrypt some of the other, the later ones, right? It needs to be accessing it um, from the first and how it's chained together. So streaming cipher, you often see this for the web and it's one bit at a time, it's faster, okay? It's, it takes less resources because we're only encrypting one bit where Block cipher, it requires more resources, right? More time and it needs to chunk it up. And you often see this in, in data or larger sets of data. Um, so let's say somebody is sending an, an you know, encryption uh, file, an encrypted file, they can also use block cipher. So once the, the message is received with that file, what will happen is when it decrypts, right, it decrypts in chunks and then it will reassemble the data back together into the entire piece, of, you know, the entire data. Um, so when it decipher, it deciphers it in chunks, okay? And another area that we previously talked about is steganography. This is a way to hide data. So you don't have to encrypt all the data, you can actually embed the data, you can hide the data. Now this can be used for good or bad, same thing with encryption, right? You probably heard a lot about ransomware and ransomware capitalize on encryption. It, <clears throat> um, what it does is, you know, they would hold the data for ransom by encrypting the data and the bad guys, they would have the key, right? And they would make companies or individual to pay up, right? Like if you want your data back, you have to pay the ransom, right? Let's say a million dollars or $200,000. And likely that when the companies pay, they will not be able to obtain all the data back. 
because the way that they use encryption is likely that it's just a one-way encryption. The decryption process, right? They won't be able to get all the data back. So nowadays, most companies don't pay. So they rather lose a little bit of time going back and pull all the backup data, right? They might lose some data in the process, but um, they won't be able to lose additional money uh, with that, right? So um, the latest part with ransomware is now that they realize that companies are backing up a lot of the data, they hold user accounts for ransom. So let's say that you have a CEO and the CEO makes all the decision in the company. So once they get into the system and they find this account, what they'll do is they would hold the account, right? Um, so that way, and even you know, so, and they would disable some of the functionality from the administrator where the administrator cannot release that account or reset or recreate something similar to that. So um, it has changed quite a bit in the way how people use ransom in security. And so what you have is you have encryption that was originally used for a lot of the ransomware. Any question? Okay. So another thing that's also used is called digital signature and digital signature also use certificate. It's a way that we can show that you are who you are, right? Like how you would sign a form, <clears throat> wet sign, that's what we call like at the DMV, you would sign your driver license. Um, we can use your the system to create a digital signature. And what that does is it's gonna tie the user credential authentication to specific timestamp, the time that this is initiated and also the integrity of that piece of data. Like I would sign a PDF form, right? Um, to say that, you know, I am the loan applicant for, you know, maybe an auto loan or a property, etc. So non-repudiation really is the purpose of it is to prevent the party from denying the action. It generates that log. It shows that this happens. It's kind of like how you would go to a place and you would sign and show your ID and you, they would verify that you are who you are, right? And there's a witness, right? And they would stamp it. And it says that, you know, you cannot argue that you sign on this date, okay? Could be for court reason, for legal purposes, et cetera, okay? So um, next we're gonna talk about hashes. So the first hash that we're gonna talk about is called MD5. And this is commonly used. It's still being used and it has weaknesses. There's vulnerability that's found. So MD5 stands for message digest five. It produces a 128 bit hash. So when you're downloading uh, software from a lot of different websites like Kali um, or even Oracle, right? Uh, let's say that you're downloading Java packages or you're downloading an application. Uh, what you will see is they're gonna give you the hash value for that particular download because that way you can use it to verify that your files is, has integrity, right? Um, it doesn't have anything that would change the actual original file. Why is that? Well, what if somebody put in a virus in, that, in, in the code for that application? It would definitely change the hash value from the original file. So in 1992, it was created. And as you've seen, right, over decades, we still use it. Um, <clears throat> and then in 2004, 
it was found that there's vulnerability. And there are a lot of tools and websites that you can use to calculate the hash and interpret it, right? And for attackers, that's what they would do is they would study these hashes, right? And find ways to manipulate the hash. Um, so it's widely used in email, files, storage, like, you know, uh, backup, drive, uh, things like that, downloads and executable files. So when you download like application executables, this is when you often see it. So for number two, we can put down that MD5 is widely used in email, files, storage, downloads, and executable files. I added this, you don't have to put it down, but keep in mind that it exists, vulnerability exists in MD5. So you shouldn't use it that often. Okay, any question? So as one technology has vulnerability, it pushes the industry to move forward and produce newer tools, right? Newer hashes, newer encryption. There are only a few unbreakable encryptions, right? Um, and algorithm, and some of those are proprietary. That means that it's owned by an individual organization. And then there are variation of open source type of technology where it's shared. And because it's open source, the source code is available. So that means that it would be prone to some vulnerability or some form of attack. Okay. So for encryption attack, you often see that they would obtain the key. It would be easier to take the key than to try to reverse engineer the encryption. Uh, it would take too much time and resources or the effort would, would be pointless. So, um, Often for web-based encryption, they would try to, you know, eavesdrop or monitor the traffic, trying to obtain some, some information so that way they can uh, figure out the hashes because the hash is going to also tie to the key. And so that way they can try to get the key. Okay. And that's how they're able to decrypt. Okay, so on the next one, we're gonna talk about SHA or SHA. So security hash algorithm, the first version SHA-1 was created by NSA and they improved SHA-1 to SHA-2, SHA-2. So NSA was the entity or the organization that developed secure hash algorithm. So SHA-0 is not used, okay? SHA-1 is the updated version from SHA-0 and it's capable of using or creating 160-bit hashes. So longer hashes, right? The longer the hashes, the better because it would take longer to calculate the hash. Um, so some of the earlier the earlier, like the MD5, you see on, on average, you often see like at least 128 bit hash. And then SHA-2 is an improvement of version one. And um, so with, with that hash, the length of that hash can be 256 bits, 512 bits, 224 or 384. So it comes in variations. That is SHA-2. And um, for SHA-3, 
it's a newer version. And KSAC is the entity that created SHA-3. It would be the same size or the same hash length as a SHA-2. So how do they figure out the hashes? They capture the hash. They would take that value or that length, right? Like I said, numbers and letters, and they would compare it to a list of good hash. And you saw some of this when you look at cane enable application when you did the password crack. It's exactly that, right? You saw the, the uh, LTM hashes and NTLTM hashes. So what you see is basically it's comparing to a good hash and that's how it could, once you have the hash, you can, you can figure out the key and the system will be able to release a key and then it's gonna, it's gonna um, open or decrypt, okay? Because password in, in Windows environment is stored as an encrypted file. Okay. or the shadow file of the password is encrypted. So it's, it's kind of like um, how you have a safe combination that will be your hash, right? And then inside that safe, you would have a key to a treasure box. So in order to get that key, somebody have to break the combination to the safe, right? They would figure it out, right? By trying different combination, get that key, and then open the treasure box. So for the next question, we can put down that the version for SHA, which version of SHA was created by NSA? That will be version one and version two. And you can find this, uh, the answer for that on page one in our notes. So another type of hash is called HMAC or HMAC. It's hash-based message authentication code. It's similar to MD5 and SHA-1. So it used a shared key and it would randomly generate for from the source to the destination. Uh, you often see this with IPsec. We talked about virtual private network last week, VPN, right? IPsec and TLS. So for virtual private network using IPsec and then TLS, you would see that with HTTPS or, you know, secure website. So it would use a version of the HMAC. And the way that they design this is it's usually used with MD5 or SHA-1. So I list the process here. So the hash is created from the sender's computer. And if it's being attacked, the attacker would insert the hash after modifying the message. So that way the hash looks like it's genuine. And then the hash is created on the receiver computer because there has to be two hashes and they need to be compared. Um, the hashes of the modify message are then compared and it will be the same, okay? So that's how they're able to attack that. Then after that, H, so in doing that process, HMAC would create a key and that key, right? Because remember the sender generate the hash to make the key and the receiver generate the hash Right, so once those, those processes are in place, the key is, is shared, okay? And that key is used to decrypt, right? The session or the data. 
So now the attacker intervenes, modified the hash to make it look like it's, it's the original hash, right? And then sends it uh, to the receiver. So then when the computer, when the receiver receives the hash of the message, it, they, it's gonna use the share key to compare the hashes from the receiver. If it's different, then the message no longer has integrity. If it's the same, then they're able to say, okay, the message is genuine. Okay, then it will decrypt, it will open. Okay, so this is more for, HMAC is used for communication with the hashes um, on how this communication can be established. It's like a, a three-way check, right? Um, on one on each end. And then at the end, it's gonna check the content of the data. So the protocols that use this HMAC for number four would be your IPsec and TLS. And they use a version HMAC MD5 and HMAC SHA-1. Okay, any question on hashes? So from the development side, like programmers, developers, right, when they release their software, they would use hashes, you know, for software download, um, once they release it to the users or the community. Um, so if you go into computer science and other area, you also see hashes being used. And then from the cybersecurity side, you would see hashes being used for encryption, it uses for things that we would need to validate integrity. Now, um, we see a lot of like uses in hashes when we look at forensic. Um, so things from email to cloud storage to even, you know, save files on disk, um, we would take the hash value and then we would, con we would calculate it or even data that's written to RAM, right? Um, so we would take the value of the hash, try to calculate, interpret it, and with that, we'll be able to access specific type of data. So it holds the key to a lot of different things um, in cybersecurity um, outside of just the use and encryption. Okay, they implement it for a lot of use. That's what I'm saying. So one of the things that I wanted to mention before we get into salting is um, RIPEMD or R-I-P-E-M-D. And this stands for Race Integrity Primitives Evaluation Message Digest. It's a hash function that's used for integrity. It can also be used with MD5, SHA, and HMAC. So we can use it to evaluate the authenticity or the integrity of that message on top of what we already have. So it would create 168-bit hash value. This is going to be fixed size, so it doesn't change. Some of them are variant, like what we, the ones we talked about. This one is a fixed value at 160-bit. Then if you use other versions, it will be fixed to the bit size, 128, 256, 320 bits. So in hashing files, 
um, what they did was they create a function that would be different string of characters and it's irreversible, okay? This is always gonna be the same no matter how many times you recalculate it. So let's say that you have file one, okay? And you calculate the hash today, right? On the 14th of November. Two months from now, right? If that file hasn't been changed, you calculate it again, it should be exactly the same. And that's the point in hash. If it's changed, that means it's been modified, right? Or tampered with. And hashing verifies that it has integrity, stays the same, okay? Hasn't been changed. So that's why you see this hash value being used for download is that it should be the same as what they release, right? If it's different, then that means that something has changed it, right? Um, maybe a malware that was added or somebody, you know, tamper with that, that particular file. Okay. So hash is also used for passwords as you've seen in Cane Enable. And we previously talked about salting passwords, adding extra characters to them, kind of like how you add salt to your food to make it taste better, right? So this, when, when we salt it, we just add additional bits to the password so that way it doesn't look like it would be your simple password, right? Or that same password. Question. Sure. Can you hash an entire laptop or like the entire iPad? Uh, no, because too large. Uh, I You can do the files within the hash. The way it's used is to really for the object in the container. You can do some storage and there's limitation based on the size of it. So could you hash the C drive on, um, on Windows? depending on how large is your C drive. If it's, as you know, that hash, there's certain hash that would reach a certain bit size, right? So you want it to implement for different file size values. Um, so I would recommend hashing important files on the iPad or the laptop. Um, now hash doesn't mean that it's not completely secure, right? It just means that it it's, has integrity, that's all. So if somebody modify it, you would know. Uh, a quicker way on from a user standpoint is to control permission on it. Put it as read only or re deny all access. Really easy, right? Like for Windows. Um, so for example, like I wanted to change this letter recommendation for one of my students. Um, to use security tab. And then you can deny all, like you can add the users group and then deny all. Only the administrator would be able to access that or specific user would have full access, et cetera. Okay. And also the system. Thank so you. it's that, yeah, you're welcome. That's a better way to control it than because you have to remember that hash used a lot of resources too, right? And it still needs to store. And you can use brute force to break some of the hash or you can use rainbow attack to match hashes. So. Okay. Um, okay, so another way that they would also protect the key is called key stretching. Right. Remember that if they get the hash, they get your key. So if we lengthen the key and then we make it look not like the key, right, it won't be so easy for them to use it. Remember, security is about buying time. There's never 100% security. OK, it's about buying that little bit of time so we can track, monitor and prevent. 
So we simply lengthen the key and all that is is we can change the strength, right, of the store password to minimize the, the, the brute force and we can extend the key length or add in, you know, bits, but it, it won't be part of that key originally. Um, we can use salting passwords to protect our, our system. So we would add random bits to make them look more complex. Okay. And then this is um, a function for salting passwords. So it would add at least 64 bits and it uses pseudo random bits to add into the actual password base key. So in many email application, when you are trying to encrypt, you have to create a password or a passphrase, right? And that password or passphrase would be related to that key. So what, when that happens, when you create a password, it generates a hash and that hash is linked to the key. So if we, if we, we add in 64 bits into that passphrase, it will be harder for somebody to brute force that password or passphrase to get our key. So again, we're buying time, right? Um, an encryption tool that we can use is called Bcrypt. And this was created from another cryptography tool called Blowfish. And Blowfish is a block cipher. So it chunks, right? It groups the data into uh, different groups and then that it's gonna encrypt in groups. <clears throat> it was originally used for Unix and then later updated to Linux. Um, and in Linux system, you would see Bcrypt being used to, sh to store shadow passwords. Okay, now people argue that Linux is more secure than Windows, right? It's just there are not a lot of malware and tools that would interface or it affect Linux system as, as much as Microsoft because Microsoft is very, very commonly used. So Microsoft uses a different cryptography tool to store the shadow password. So when you create your password, right, it stores it in a location as an encrypted file. Same thing with Linux. It uses bcrypt to store your shadow password. And bcrypt is built on Blowfish. And we'll talk about Blowfish shortly. So, this is kind of lengthy. You don't have to put everything, but as long as you understand what salting means, right? So for number five, it asks you, what is a salt in hashing? It's a way for us to add random data to the input of a hash function to guarantee a unique output, which is a hash even when the inputs are the same. So subsequently, the unique hash produced by adding the salt can protect us against different attack vectors, right? Like they can listen to your traffic and use the initiation vector, the IV, to trying to capture that session key or rainbow attack or rainbow table attacks. We can also use salt to slow down dictionary and brute force attacks. So it has a lot of, you know, functionality for security by just adding random data into that hash function. So if you're studying programming and software development, right? Think about how companies design security oriented software, right? Or software that has security, right? How you can protect your hashes or the user password for that applications, 
um, etc. So salt is a, a good way that we can implement solution to slow down attacks, not prevent it, slow it down. And we talked about Bcrypt. It is based on Blowfish. Block Cipher was used, Blowfish was used in Unix. And you know, Apple is built on Unix architecture or platform, I should say, I shouldn't say architecture, platform. And then transition to, you know, different versions of OS is down the line. So it started as Unix oriented system. And then Microsoft borrowed, I shouldn't say steal, but borrow Unix and other operating systems concept and implement it into their operating system. So Bcrypt is used in Linux to protect stored shadow password files. So how can we know if our message has been jeopardized, right? You would use hash comparison. You would compare the hashes. If they're exactly the same, then they haven't been changed. It's not jeopardized. If the hashes are different, the message has lost integrity. Any questions relating to five, six, or seven? So now you know a little bit more about hash. Maybe you didn't to start, right? Now you understand a little bit more, more than some of the IT students in some of the other classes, right? <laughs> so, um, Having this information is useful. So when you see it, you know what, what it's used for, right? Why do they have it? What can it do for me as security tools or mechanism? Okay. So here um, I put an example of you know, hashing a message. So we can, the application would calculate the MD5 hash from the sender computer. The hash is sent to the, the, the receiver's computer. Then the hash is created on the receiver's computer. We can compare it. If it's different, then the message has been changed. Okay, so that's where I got the answer Okay, for that question. And here you see a table of the ones that we talked about. So it shows you the comparison. As NSA developed SHA-2, you saw that they would be the organization that mainly implements that, but the industry also uses, right? the technology that was developed by NSA. Okay, so the next part, we're gonna talk about encryption, mainly different type of cryptography algorithm. Let me move this to the next page for number eight. So before we answer this, for number eight, you will find it on page three of our notes. So when you encrypt data, you have to know different types of data. 
and to use the appropriate encryption. Um, encryption is a very broad category, right? Um, but we have specific encryption for different type of data. So there are three categories of data when we look at what is stored on the system or send or you know, use, et cetera. So data at rest is like files on your storage device, right? Like files on my USB right now, that's not being used. Those are just stored, right? Think about like how at your home, you would have something that you put away and you never really use it, but it's there, right? Um, I'm such a hoarder. <laughs> I am like that too. Sometimes I have stuff that I might use. So all the old computer equipment, I just keep it there in case I might need it. So this is the data that just sits there on the storage. Um, now companies will encrypt this type of data because it's on a storage, somebody might access it. <clears throat> so we, we would likely archive the data at rest and encrypt them, okay? So especially the sensitive data. Now, the industry is responding saying that, you know, there's huge data explosion. That's why they call it big data. Everybody's using data, accessing data, um, storing data. Um, so ultimately, should we encrypt everything? No, only the sensitive data. And this is why we would classify the data, private data or very important data, then we would encrypt that. Okay, and so that same practice would be used at home or small businesses, right? Um, if you have like a customer or a client list that's very important in your business operation, um, you would use it, you would protect it with permissions. But let's say that you have the list from years ago, right? You want to still keep eventually see who your clients or keep track record of that. Um, you want to be able to protect that by encrypting it. Then data in transit, and you use this every day, right? You use it when you stream Netflix. You use it when you're accessing website. So all the packets that are, you know, sending back and forth contains data in transit. Data that's sent across networks or within the network. And when we use, like I said, websites, right, that have security, then we would also have encrypted sessions. Some of the data, like our bank account, so security number, stuff like that, would be encrypted in that session. Okay, credit card information. By law, these companies have to implement security tool to protect your data. Now, doesn't mean that they don't have data leak, right? And data leak doesn't always result in, you know, money going back to you that they lost your data. In the case of Target and many companies, TJ Maxx, um, you name it, right? Capital One. There's a lot of companies that lose our data all the time. So by law, they have to give you the privacy notice. Right? Where does your data go? How do they protect your data? What's the liability in that? And in the fine print, they would say that they would likely not be liable in the case of this and this and this circumstance. Okay. Now, some company, they would hold the liability or give you options to use a certain product to monitor your credit in the case that they lose your data, but they don't have to do that, right? Um, now, when they have data leak, they would have to, they can possibly face lawsuit, right? Um, could be a group of people would sue them, other organization would sue them, or the government comes back and find them. Like in a hospital, if they lose patient's records, um, you know, they give out patient information without authorization, then they would get fined. And that's, you know, different case to case. 
So data in transit is what we use every day. It's in the move, right? Sometimes you they, they would say that data in the move. <clears throat> data in use is data that's being accessed on a system, right? Like your files, your homework files, uh, things that you open, your MP3 that you listen to, when you're driving your car, you act opening your phone, you listen to your music. Um, that type of data is usually not encrypted because it's often used. And the application can be used to encrypt those type of data, right? If the data is very sensitive, of course. But a lot of the times company don't encrypt data in use because it's often accessed by users and it will take a lot of resources and time to encrypt, decrypt and manage the encryption process. Okay. So let's, you can find the answer on page three. We can reiterate that. You can summarize it if you want. So data at rest, stored on media, right? Encrypted storage devices, folders, data in transit. It's sent over a network, on the web, use an email, data in use, access by the user, right? Not encrypted while in use. Question? Yes. I know this isn't necessarily related to the class, but uh, from your experience in Black Friday, like what, what are good deals on, you know, tech stuff? Like, you know, like a, a one terabyte hard drive that's um, not SSD is what, like $40? And what would be like a good price for a one terabyte SSD um, and things like yeah. that? Yeah, so 50 or less is a good deal on SSD depending on the different type of SSD, because a lot of the ones that they're selling cheaper are hybrid SSD. They're not fully SSD. So it uses SATA connection with, with uh, flash technology, you see. Um, so when you buy those, you have to be aware of what type it is. Like if you see a, an M.2 that's, you know, from a good brand company, because Sometimes some companies make not so good storage. Um, yeah, I say tear by anything less than $50 uh, or less than, sometimes they could go to 70 to 100. It depends on the brand and the technology itself. Like I said, um, if you can find it for 50 bucks, go for it. Because I think on average, 250 gig is roughly a less than $40 now. Um, when I bought mine last month, it was it was very cheap, like less than 40 bucks on some of the sales. So storage is a good um, thing to have, right? Because we have so many things, like look at all the pictures on your phone. What happens if your phone dies or, you know, uh, videos that you record of your family and your kids. Those are the things that are, to me, more valuable than uh, because, you know, it ties to memories and things like that. And then important documents and things that you would use. Um, and you can even compress the, the files so that way it would save storage space because likely that you might not use it so often. So it will just be at rest, right? Um, but I, uh, I have a bad habit of picking up a laptop every Black Friday. <laughs> So um, if you are in, in the market for a good laptop, keep an eye out. I know Best Buy, sometimes they have good deals on laptop. I picked up one last Black Friday um, and it was, it was adequate. There are a lot of gaming systems that are also on sale. That's a good deal. So if you like desktop, you can also find parts, um, video cards, um, you know, so it's always good to have a secondary computer, especially if your children are online all the time. 
for school. Um, so in case if a computer dies, you're not in, in, in a situation. So if it's affordable, if you can buy it, I would have a secondary system. Um, a lot of people buy television, right? I bought a TV last, uh, last Black Friday and it was very hectic just to go get the TV. But um, so if you're in the market for that, that's also a good time to buy hardware. Um, outside of that, Flash drives are super dirt cheap. Always good to have backup storage for school and things, um, you know, for your phone, for your tablets. Um, but how, how would I know what is a what is a good deal? Like I can't tell. Like what is a good deal for a laptop? Um, so if you're looking at the processor, look at the processor model. So I when I look at a laptop, I part everything out. Like I look at how much is a processor on by itself? How much is RAM by itself? Like if it says, you know, 16 gig of RAM at this type of RAM, like, so I, I would think of it as separate components. And then I kind of look at those prices and then I combine them together. And I would say, okay, throwing in the OS, how much would the system, if I was to kind of like build it, right? Um, or even a desktop in that sense. Uh, so I have a better picture of how much it would be because, or you can use different, um, you know, vendor, you can see different retailer websites uh, to compare. But I would start out with like a decent processor. If I see that would capture my attention right away. Like if I see an i7 or, you know, a Ryzen 7, that's, that's, decent, that's cheap on the laptop, I'm going to start looking more into it. But, you know, things like with the cheaper processor, I'll be like, eh, pass, next one. But sometimes it's also depending on the price range. Um, Is so it like an i5 a cheap processor? No, i5, 10th generation and up is good. Don't go anything earlier. Okay. So 10, i5 10th generation beat some of the i7. So they still update some of the old ones. So, you know, uh, nothing wrong with having an i5, but depending on the generation and the clock speed. Okay. So now having an older processor is okay. If it's a stable processor, works for you. I, I bought a couple systems before with i5 and at that time, it was like seventh or eighth generation. Um, and I still have it, it's still, it still works. Um, I use it as a spare laptop, but having a laptop is convenient in that, you know, you can take it anywhere, you can give it to your children. Um, so if you can find something and a uh, ballpark, like good, decent system, anything less than 900, like it would be between seven to nine, and then you got the mid range that's going to be, I want to say, four to six hundred dollars, and and then you got the lower end. And if you want like just a cheapy laptop for the kids to play with or occasionally surf the internet, you can find something that's even less than four hundred bucks. Um, Micro Center is a good place to to look also, and if you do go to the store, it's crazy, right? Even now, so. But if you can buy it online and then go pick it up and even pick up, you have to get in line. So um, that's what I usually do with Best Buy. And I try to get price match with Best Buy and Amazon. Okay, sidetrack a little bit. Sorry, I love computer parts and stuff. So um, I tend to kind of like get all into that. I saw some chat questions or comments. Just questions on the previous questions. Okay, so um, we talked about data and use, data at rest, data in motion. Uh, for number nine, the difference between block and stream cipher. Block encrypts the data in specific size block or chunk, right? 64-bit or 128-bit block. So when you have a very large file, it would divide it into different blocks. 
and then encrypt, encrypt each block separately. Effective when used for file or database. So block cipher is often used for files or database, right? Not web traffic. Stream is more efficient than block. And we would use it when we don't know the size of our data. And it would stream continuously. So one bit at a time. So it's sent in continuous stream over the network. And the way we implement this is we don't reuse the key. And so most of the web-based encryption technology uses symmetric key and stream technology. Okay, so now you understand the difference between block and stream. The difference between symmetric and asymmetric. So earlier we talked about asymmetric using two keys in match pair to encrypt and decrypt. You don't have to put this in, but that's if you can for additional notes and information for yourself. So if you're using public key to encrypt, you would use the private key to decrypt the matching private key. You would use the private key to encrypt, then you would use a public key to decrypt and only public key can be sent. This is very powerful, but it is resource intensive. Use a lot of resources, processor, right, and RAM. That's what we're looking at as resources. The key exchange uses symmetric to transport the key. So it used an encrypted session to pass the key. So on top of that, to give each other the key, the sender and the receiver, you would have an encrypted session for that. Uh, symmetric encryption uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt data. Secret key encryption or session key encryption is what it's also known as. An example of symmetric is substitution cipher. So for those of you who are in this class that take my CIS 7, I think David is, um, you would know about substitution cipher. So what it does is it, it um, take something like Caesar cipher. So Julius Caesar would write out the message and he would use substituted letters in the alphabet for the message, so using shift. So for example, if he's using A and it shifted three, it will be B, C, D, so that A becomes a D, so it would be encoded or substituted with the newer shifted character. So that's how substitution cipher worked. And he was the first one that derived that type of encryption later on we use the same concept and develop ROT13, which is called rotation 13, shifting 13 character and looping back to the beginning at the end of the alphabet. Okay. So substitution cipher also uses symmetric key. Now it would be more effective if 
for symmetric encryption if the key is not always used to encrypt and decrypt. Um, what they can do is they can swap keys, change key, like a one-time base key. So something like Envisioner, it would use a one-time key. Um, and Envisioner is not the strongest, nor Caesar or ROT13. But you would see that if you dispose the key, they are not reusable, then you have a little bit better security, right? We have a little bit more time. So you would likely see block stream symmetric and asymmetric encryption on your quizzes game, the game that I release. And we don't have a regular quiz this week. So the last day I wanna be nice and not having to give you another quiz. So you can play the game, get the extra credit and then possibly win an e-gift card. Okay. All right, any questions on 10? So the best encryption tool should be asymmetric. So when that, if, you, if you're shopping for encryption tool or technology, or you're looking to implement that for your company, you should think about asymmetric encryption. For symmetric encryption, light, easy, however, right? Not so strong, but if you use disposable keys, right? Your o O2P one time, right? For the key, then it would be better, okay? And symmetric is often used for web traffic and other things. Okay, so before we get into the next part, which is defense in depth and security, I want to expand on encryption a little bit, introduce you to some other type of encryption algorithm. So encryption, two very important areas. The encryption is as strong as its algorithm. An algorithm means that is a mathematical calculation of the data and it's always gonna be the same, okay? Which makes it have integrity. The key, so in the key itself, there's the length of the key, right? And how that key is stored and exchanged is very important. So the key is just a number that provides validity for the encryption. Okay, we would use that value to be able to decrypt or convert our data back to readable text. And to implement that with the key, the key is used with that algorithm to put the data back into readable text. Okay, so there is random and there's pseudo random. Right, sometimes you would hear, oh, this is pseudo random. Earlier we talked about that. So, random numbers, sometime encryption would use random numbers or pseudo random, right, as input, as values. That would be known as deterministic algorithm. Okay, now pseudo random means that it looks like it's random, but it's always going to be the same. And those of you who took programming, you know this, right? In the programming library, you can implement it to generate numbers that looks like it's random, but it's pseudo random. So when you run your program, it's always going to be the same. 
where truly random numbers, it's going to be different every single time. So we want true random, right? Pseudo random is implemented for convenience. Okay. It's not as resource intensive. If IV, this, you would see this in um, encrypted traffic, right? IV attacks use, they would capture the vector value. And it would have a starting value for a cryptographic algorithm. And so they can use that to calculate, right? Um, the value for that session. So that way they can inject, right, uh, into the packet. Sometimes you would hear the term nonce, and that would mean that the number is used once. It would have a seed or a starting number, like at zero. Okay. XOR is a logical operation, exclusive OR. That's what it stands for. And it would use an encryption to compare two inputs. If they are the same, it's gonna give you a true. If they are different, it's giving you a false. And this is an area of integrity that was implemented, okay? And another term you're gonna hear is confusion and defusion. So if they refer to confusion, it means that it's different than the plain text. That's the whole point in cryptography is to make it look confusion, right? Defusion is to ensure that there's small changes in the plain text would result in the large changes in the ciphertext. So if we modify something in the plain text, minute change in there, then it's going to modify the encrypted text in a larger way. Secret algorithm means keeping private and we want to review it continuously to look at the flaws. So companies that produce this cryptography algorithm or they sell products that have that, right? They would assess the flaws continuously to make sure that their product is quality, has quality Another term you also hear is weak or depreciated algorithm. That means that it's been cracked, it has vulnerability, and it has flaws in the algorithm. And that changes time to time, right? Something can be very secretive one year and the next year someone has found the flaws in it. Like SSL, secure socket layer. And high resilience in cryptography just means that the encryption key is secure and the attacker cannot obtain that key. Now, I mentioned this to many of my classes. Cryptography is a course on its own. UC Berkeley, when they teach cryptography for development, it's a course, okay? Um, many institutions, because you know, so many different things can be implemented to really build that algorithm. This is just giving you the general concept and terminology so you understand what they mean when you refer to a certain type of cryptography. Okay, so we already talked about block and cipher, block and stream cipher. Um, another thing I just want to touch lightly on is your modes of cipher. Electronic codebook, your ECB is the simplest mode. 
this makes it, it divides it into different blocks and encrypt the block. And so in the block cipher, it would use the ECB. Now that for the olden days, the newer is they use a CBC, cipher blockchaining. It uses symmetric block ciphers. It also uses IV randomization. So it would combine the subsequent block with the previous block, kind of like what I talk about the train, right? By using exclusive or operation or logical operator. So each block is dependent on the previous block. So you cannot decrypt the one in the middle without the one prior to that and the one prior to that and the one prior to that. So that's why it's, it's highly secure but it's slow, okay? It's very, you see that it would be delayed, less efficient than other modes. So the, when they talk about blockchain in cryptocurrency, that's what they use. They use this mode. And now you understand what that is. And another mode is your counter mode. It converts block into stream. So it takes the chunks and break it into its individual piece. And then it adds in the IV, the vector value. So that would be a counter value and also a counter value that's gonna be added to the plain text block, okay? And it's gonna generate a different key after that for each of the block once it converts it into smaller pieces. So when you use this with a multiprocessor system, most of our servers are, right? It would be able to process it at the same time. Now, if you're using on a single processor system, then it will be very slow, okay? So this is designed for more modern technology and more advanced, right? higher equipped hardware system. And then your GCN is also used for block ciphers like the CTN. It doesn't require authentication because it actually provides, it's equipped with all of that within. It uses hashes for integrity and it is efficient. Okay, so it's a derived version of your counter mode. That's what it is, the later version. Okay, so here it talks a little bit about your symmetric encryption. We touch on that. So for that question, you can refer to page four. Now you know that your smartphone and your wireless technology uses AES. So your standard AES uses 128-bit keys or 256-bit keys. The longer the keys, the better. So the example I use here is two servers send encrypted traffic back and forth using AES. One is going to generate that key, sends that key to the second server, which is used to decrypt. Now, we don't want to reuse the same key over and over again, because if that key is captured, you're done. Right? One time use. So here's more on AES. Stands for Advanced Encrypted Standard. You can use it to encrypt a 128-bit block. It is a block cipher using symmetric keys. Okay. So for Security Plus, they expect you to know cryptography like this, okay? Like different types, what they are, how they're used. For other security certification, they expect you to know cryptography like this. I added some stuff 
because the book has some of the really good content, but some of the things you see in my note, I also had pulled from other sources. So it's, you know, you get a little bit more here. So AES is one of the top 15. So it is good to use AES. It's fast. That's why it uses symmetric. It requires a one pass to encrypt and a decrypt at least. Okay. So if you, if you see a list of cryptography to use, if AES is on there, select it, right? Especially for like, you know, home use or your system use. AES was originally implemented with uh, the iPhone earlier in the earlier iPhone, I wanted to say four or even before the five, okay? At the end of the iPhone two, because the iPhone two, two months after it was released, it was cracked because Apple came out and said, oh, you can't break our phone. And one of the famous hacker, right? He made a video showing how it was done in 24 hours. So Apple came back and redeveloped their iOS and their system. And later on they implemented and, you know, and AES was also implemented all on some of the mobile devices, other vendor as well, okay? Your DES is also symmetric block cipher. This is a smaller bit block, 60 bit compared to 128 bit. It uses smaller key, 56. This was broken. <clears throat> the creator for this, he's still alive. And you can still research, you can research it. Um, the, the, it was broken by brute force attack. So they broke the key and that's how it was deciphered. Not recommended for today's use. From DES, they uh, upgraded it to triple DES. So when you see three DES, this is called triple DES. It's also a block cipher symmetric key. It requires three passes using multiple keys. So it's like this. This is my analogy. You have a small treasure box. You lock it with the key, right? And you put that key inside another box you lock that second box, put that key inside a larger box, lock that box. So it requires three passes with three different keys. So to open it, I have to open the outer box, get the key for the second one, open the second box, get the key for the last one, open the third box. It's, doesn't, it's not used as often as AES because it's not fast. Okay, but it is secure. It's smaller than bit size, as you can see for the variation of 56 bit, but the later ones like the 168 is the biggest. Compared to some of the other cryptography algorithm, you can go up higher than 256 to 512 or even in the thousand. Okay. RC4 is Ron Rivis, right? Um, this is the version four that he released. RC stands for Ron's code, <coughs> or it's also known as your Rivis cipher. So we can go from 40 bit up to 10, uh, 2048. This is a stream cipher bit by bit using symmetric keys. Okay, many of them are symmetric. So it used to be used for HTTPS, secure socket layer, and TLS. In 2013, NSA broke it and show Ron Rivis that it broke, right? So they recommended that you would use AES in place of it. Blowfish and two fish is used today. This is a block cipher using symmetric key. It supports its key length from 32 to 448 bits. 
Okay, so when you look at cryptography, you have the key and key length, and then you have cryptography size, which is what it's been saying, block or stream, right? So this is a 64-bit block. Bruce Schneier is the creator for this. He shows up at uh, DEF CON. You guys know what DEF CON is? So before COVID, of course, you can find YouTube video on DEF CON, D-E-F. C-O-N, if you don't know. Uh, DEF CON is a conference for hacking. And usually it's holds in Las Vegas, right? Um, uh, Caesar Palace used to host it. Now I think they move it to a different venue there. Same group of hotel owner, but they show different techniques from hacking ATM to whatever, right? If you do go, do not bring electronic devices ever your smartphone not even and you have to use cash they don't take anything and you pay at the door it costs about 200 and something dollars to enter and it's a very cool convention to to, to attend you can see a lot of different things um you know from hacking cars to you know and fbi nsa and other agencies they show up there too okay so he uh, attended quite a few DEF CON and speak at, at, or he spoke at some of the conferences and he still does. The higher end convention for hacking is called Black Hat, very expensive. It starts at uh, about a thousand or $2,000 for entrance. And that's more advanced level. Um, they're held in New York, Chicago, San Francisco um, before. Now, because of COVID, you don't see some of that. DEF CON is usually late July going to early August or sometime in July, depending on um, their time span. And it's like a week long. Um, Black Hat, I think it's early spring, I wanna say, right? Um, so that will be the event, okay? So Two Fish encrypts 128-bit blocks. And this is its key length. It's one of the best within the top 15. Okay. So between Blowfish and Two Fish, Two Fish is better. It's faster than uh, AES, actually. Okay. So there you go. And then symmetric. So the well-known one for asymmetric is your RSA. Okay. And RSA is commonly used today. So here on the bottom, it talks about certificate, what they are. You Every time you download an application on your phone, right? Or you, when you use your app, one, the first time you download it, it downloads a certificate, right? You ever get that notification saying it's trying to access your location, right? Or it's trying to access your contact list or your camera. The certificate states that, right? So the app, the, the designer for that, what they do is they create this file. It is a file, a digital document that contains some of the information about that application, okay? It's issued, right, um, from the, the either a server, right? If it's a web app, it will be generated from the server. On that, it will tell you what, what serial number it is so that way they can track it, who is the provider, how long is it val valid for, a lot of the web app when it has no expiration. Sometimes if your certificate is expired, it will show that your certificate is expired. You have to download another one or update it. The subject, the public key and the usage. This is the area that it gets a lot of people permission to access. So on that certificate, it will say permission to access your camera, right? Like your QR code scanner, it has permission to access your camera. And if you don't give it permission, you cannot use it. 
um, Google Map has access to your GPS, right? But sometime app would have access to other things than the things that it's mainly functioning with, right? Like your contact list, because they wanted to use that to market to people, that same product. Um, sometime microphone, like Alexa, <laughs> um, you know, things like that, or Cortana. Okay, questions? Uh, yes. So why would like whenever I go on eBay, why would it say that, you know, Google Chrome allowed access to the webcam? Um, Google Chrome is allowed access to the webcam because you installed the Google Chrome. It came with a certificate that activate the webcam. It shouldn't. Right. A good app would allow you to disallow certain things, um, things that it doesn't really need. The reason why Google Chrome needs to access your webcam is because people still take pictures and scan things and ask what it is. Okay, that was so before Google came out with the way they search for things, um, there was a creator, I forgot his name now, but he first started by creating an app that uh, basically you can take picture of things and places and then put it into a search engine and it's gonna tell you what it is, right? Uh, image recognition type of uh, technology. He sold it to Google and that was when they started implementing that as part of their engine. So their engine is built into Chrome and therefore it access your webcam. Okay. But it's, it's using it to take a picture? Well, Not necessarily, well, it turns it on and you can take a picture of it. So it turns it on. So the way that they wrote, they developed that is that they, it's, it's a function. So they wrote it to be part of it in case you use it. Now, not all users use that. I never use my camera with, with my Chrome. Um, and I try to disable as many stuff as I can. Like I turn off my GPS. Um, I turn off my microphone on individual apps. My McAfee doesn't have all the policies that are required to scan most of my storage devices on my, uh, my phone and my tablet. Um, you can, you know, if you go into the app settings, you can also, if it's a good app, it will let you configure that. You should. Because well, I, yeah. I guess I was just curious why, you know, that. I get prompted from Google Chrome for like eBay, but not like Amazon because, or Target. Because eBay is used to sell and buy and most people would take pictures for their products to sell on eBay or to, uh, you know, look for products. On oh, I, I understand what you're saying. So it's for the full functionality of the app. Right, right. And we, we might not use it. And that's the problem in the security in the app is that it, we don't use it and it's there and somebody can tap into that and turn it on. And that's a problem, right? And that's an IoT problem. Uh, and you see that all the time with IoT is that there's functionality for the full capacity of that device, but the majority of the people, they only use 50% of that cap capacity. So somebody else get into the network and use the other 50. Like, look at what's happening inside your house. I don't ever use internal camera in my home. And, you know, since Zoom, I started using more webcam and such, but when you don't use it, put a tape on it, turn it off, right? Unplug it because you've seen videos of people showing on, the, on YouTube in different area that they turn on camera in people's house and they look and see what's happening. A lot of the, the, the like ring and some of these things, right? It goes to a public server, public DNS. And that's why you see like images that people got to show on like social media about, you know, people stealing packages, you know, stuff like that when people don't post it uh, because they have access to those type of servers and you can pull, pull footages. In America, even public footages, um, there's if it has sound, you have there's some legal requirement with that. But in other countries like the UK, they have public camera 
we start using more traffic based camera but they have like the t the the ct cctv camera in australia uk all of that is accessed by the police in china in a lot of the countries but i'm sidetracking now so anyways when you use your app turn off the permissions for the things you don't need and then if it needs to it'll ask you and you can allow it okay um Here's RSA information. This is very strong. The key's length is very high. Um, and you can also use a short lifetime key. So it will just live for a while for that session. It's called ephemeral key. Okay. And then another key that you can use is called Deffy Hellman. When I was going to school, we learn a lot about RSA because they've been around for a long time. Uh, and back then, you know, they talk a lot about Deffy Hellman static key. Um, later on, you started to see, you know, more technique in producing keys for RSA. And this is still a research area for some university. I know UCR is looking into this and um, other institutions looking into this, but look at how long it's been around, right? as old as I am. Ellipt elliptic curve. This is a lightweight, originally was implemented by our government. Um, ECC is very lightweight, low processing power. It's good for small devices. And it uses elliptic curves and graphing points to, to generate keys. And here's Duffy Hellman. We talked about steganography already and digital signature. So downgrade attack is uh, a way to force the system to decrease the security because there's a lack of um, security in the encryption suite itself. Okay. People install security tool encryption thinking that it's it's strong and it's great, right? But you know that every tool has a flaw some way or another. Some are bigger than others and some are fixable and some are not. So um, attackers are known to look for those flaws, right? Um, and the Red Hat attacker, they would look for those flaws and point it out to companies so they can fix it. But Black Hat and some of the other area people, they would utilize it to make money, right? Um, or, you know, jeopardize data, hurt consumer, etc. Okay, any questions as far as cryptography goes? Okay, so I'm gonna let you take a break. I'm gonna come back and finish up with the rest of this. Um, and then we'll talk about the lab, which is very short, and then we'll call it a day. Okay. All right. So let's take a 15 minute break. It's 11, oh, it's 155 on my clock. So let's be back at 210.
Okay, so we're going to start back up. Um, the next part, we're going to talk about defense and death. And all that is, is we have to layer our security. So there are three areas in security that we have to address. The first is the physical security. The second is the logical security. And the third is going to be the administrative control. So defense in death basically is a way that we would layer the protection using physical, logical, and administration. So um, it's a practice in implementing several of these layers so we can protect our people as assets, data as assets, building, right, systems, so the way business look at this is that we have to measure or assess what we have and how we can protect the resources. Um, in the control, there are different control types, right? We have to physically control the facility, the access to the systems, um, access to our people, protect our people, the technical part, we can implement different solutions from a network defense. We would have systems that would be configured, policies and rules that can be configured on the system to make sure we filter, right? We allow or disallow, um, we monitor. Now in the administrative area, we gotta make sure that people are aware of the things that we are protecting, um, the rules and procedures that they need to follow in order to maintain the protection. So the policy part, we have to write it down, like how they would use the web, what kind of files they can download, how do they access the systems in our network, um, all the way to what kind of information they can disclose on the phone um, and so forth. And then the physical access uh, control is really going back to how we can protect the, the physical things. Um, our server rooms, right? Our network switches and routers, um, our facility, our building. So, we have to come up with plans and solutions to really implement all of these components so we can better, better protect you know, the assets for the organization. And at home, you have assets, right? Your family members are important. You wanna protect them. You have technology like laptops, television, things that you buy that you use that are valuable. You wanna protect that. Um, and data files and things that you maintain over time that would be useful to everyday life for your children. Um, so in a sense, we see this from a personal perspective along with organizational perspective. Um, and then for business, they have to look at vendors, um, partners, um, people that would help in their operation. So for example, if I'm Walmart, I would also protect resources coming from my distributor, um, the companies that are selling me products um, or the companies that staffing my employees. Um, so we have to implement security control to protect the communication with these companies along with the resources that these companies provide, okay? 
So you do see some extended protection beyond the scope of the internal organization um, and beyond the scope of your household, like how you would you know, have some form of protection so you can have safe communication with school, um, you know, with your children's school um, and so forth with your job. So in the security safeguards, we would look at things like parameter, fences, gates, uh, security guards. And for the building, uh, proper lighting is important, right? Uh, surveillance camera, alarm system. So in the case if somebody break in and steal computers, we, you know, it would sound off, um, we would be able to detect it. So this is more for like detection purposes. This is more for prevention or deterrence purposes. Because if you have, you know, iron fences, guards and watchdogs, right? Uh, likely that, that the thieves would deter, be deterred from entering the facility compared to if you have nothing, if your door is wide open. Um, so we want to lock our doors. We want to restrict access areas. And this is why companies use smart cards so they can only allow certain employees in certain area. Like if you look at the hospital, right? You cannot just go anywhere in the hospital. You can only be in the visiting area with the sticker that they give you, right? Or, you know, if they give you a little access card, you can only be in that, that area that they allow you to. The nurses and the doctors, they can go into different offices, different location of the hospital. So we can use a lot of the technical side to control some resources. And then we also have to implement other areas to make sure that we have all well-rounded security and that's important. Um, for the server room, it needs to be locked and it needs to be monitored um, because the servers hold important data. It's a huge resource for the organization. So we wanna limit access for the internal employees. Now, when you become a risk analysis individual, right? Sometimes that will be a computer-based desk job. A lot of the times in security, when, when we do field work, we can have a lot of different tasks from trying to circumvent the network to see the weaknesses in the network or assess applications to see the weaknesses in the application, what we can help the company in fixing, or Sometimes you have to do physical security assessment. Um, I told you the story before, if you haven't heard it, right? Uh, a couple of my former students, um, they work as consultant and, and basically they're pen tester um, and architects, right? Um, so the pen testers, they would have to test people. They would have to test the physical assets, um, meaning dropping USB to see if people will pick it up and plug it in. So um, and most of the time people do because they wanted to know who that USB belongs to, um, trying to help or sometimes it's just curious that they are. Um, and then sometimes they have to see if they can just walk to the server room and open it. Um, and if they can, then they have to report back and say that you have to do this and this and this to protect your facility. So, Cabinets needs to be locked, especially when it holds essential files. Um, could be customer credit card information, et cetera, uh, servers and equipment. I had consulted for a very small company and they had a server system sitting in the owner's office on wheels. Um, and <laughs> they would take it to different places in the office. And, and so uh, when I came and I said, what is it doing outside and in the hallway or uh, sometime in your office? And the owner would say that, oh, because, you know, we don't really have a technician. And so whoever could help fix it, we would bring it to that person. And I said, no, that's not good. Um, so I had advised them on to have a closet, something that's secure and put it in there. 
Um, in the meantime, before they did it, somebody broke in uh, from the outside, broke the glass uh, from a window and came in and took the server. Um, I don't know whether the, the thief knew what was on the server or they just took it because it's a machine. So they ended up losing all their data, um, you know, the, the equipment itself. So they have to replace the equipment, replace, rebuild the data, um, and then also fix the facility. So after that, um, we came back. And so we had to install surveillance systems um, alarm systems, camera, you name it. So they became more conscious about the physical security. So that's very important. Um, also air gap, right? Isolate networks and systems too. And um, sometimes you would see like uh, drop ceilings where they we would use that to run cable. Because if you run cable on wall and surfaces, people can cut your cable. And also it looks better, right? Um, and it's it's better with a lot of the interference with signal. So, um, and then companies would use raised floor. Like they would have a, a floor and then on top of that, they would build another wood floor and they would run the cable underneath. So, and it's for the safety of the people who walk on the floor. And also really when we look at network and security, to prevent people from jeopardizing our equipment. And that's that's one of the areas that we, we really have to address. So air gap, isolated networks and systems. Um, and outside of that, you have to control your door and access and monitor that, right? Uh, fingerprint reader, smart card systems, and they're not cheap because, and you have to maintain it. Um, but you also have to teach your user. So that's when the administrative side comes in about tailgating, about, um, you know, how to report incidents, uh, things like that. Um, signs, you can use signs to control traffic. A lot of companies um, remove server room signs because if people see that, it kind of targeted that room. Uh, so what we normally do is we would point to the sign, like if you go to a hospital, they would say, oh, this is for the visiting area, and that would be the sign. And then in other locations, they would have signs like for cardiology or for different areas where specific employees would be in that area. Um, door locks is very essential. And some company, they would use cipher lock or some kind of token-based electronic lock. Um, and you see more of the electronic lock now. Um, personally, I don't trust some of the mechanism with the electronic lock, especially you can unlock it from you know, web access and things like that, or an app on the phone. Um, that's always open up other revenue. So the way that I look at things is, you don't just have one lock. If you're using electronic lock, you really have to lock physically use a padlock or something else in addition to that. Um, so when I consult, I usually advise them to implement multiple locking mechanism. Um, proximity card systems. Um, some company would do more radio frequency and others would use other technology. Now, not all systems perfect right? You have flaws in those systems as well. So in security, when we look at that, it's an opportunity for us to help people to improve their overall security landscape. So we can say, okay, if you're using the biometric system, this is the downside of it, and this is the upside of it. And you can weigh out the risk by doing this and this and this. And so that's when they bring in consultant and people to advise them of, you know, how to approach or how to improve their operation through security. Um, and consulting job can be, can pay very well, right? Um, you don't always want it to be the field analyst forever. You want it to get into some, some things where you can be flexible. Um, I myself felt that it would be flexible to do that type of job where I can pick up a job when I want to and not when I don't want to, when it's beyond my scope or when I have to hire a, a larger team. 
then um, you know I can look at how that cost would affect my own business. So um, you would implement the physical security to better protect your assets, okay? And assets management is very important. So for the next question, it asks you about defense in depth in cybersecurity. It's a way that we would layer the protection, administration, configuration, and physical. And for number 12, it asks you to identify three physical security control. And you can list any of the three. Um, I simply just list that you can put security guards and security guards, um, you know, for the majority, they're just more of a deterrence uh, factor, right? It's when people see the guards, they likely would be more conscious about, you know, whether they should commit the crime or not. And sometimes they don't care. So it's not 100% foolproof. And that security guard can watch and monitor uh, the activities that's happening, okay? Locks on doors, cabinets, and then you should have a surveillance system. And surveillance system has changed dramatically. So now we have more access to camera. I myself use camera at home on, on the outside. So that way, you know, if, if somebody is vandalizing, I would be able to see it. And same thing with the company. For number 13, it asks you to identify three types of environmental control. So what's the point of having surveillance system locked on doors and things like that, but we would have a fire or sometime earthquake? right, in California. Um, so we would have environmental control to control temperature like HVAC system. Now, the more advanced, larger facility, they would have electronic based control. They would have like a, a control based system for all their HVAC, right? So let's think about like a facility that has like 10 buildings or like a school like Moreno Valley College or a high school where they have to control. And you don't wanna go from one building to the next to modify the temperature or adjust, right? So what they do is they centralize that and they put it into like some kind of location where the facility maintenance people would be able to control that. Um, now HVAC, because of that, it's connected to the network. And Target was is a big case, right? Um, where the attacker came from HVAC, they found a way to get into these systems. So we have to look at how we are extending these systems to, to control our environment, but we have to protect it physically and logically. <clears throat> and then fire suppression system. Um, now, if we use water, which most companies use because it's human friendly, right? But guess what happens to the electronics? If the electronics are on like laptop, you know, um, when there's a lot of water damage, it ruins the system. So company move away from using water-based systems. So when they can afford it, they would use gas-based systems. Now, gas-based system, some of the system would hurt the human. So you have to evacuate the people first, and then halon system would, would, would kick in. So it would drop the gas, and it would suppress the fire. However, right, if people are still in there, it would hurt them. So it's more of a weighing a risk in some of the things that we use. Um, the third thing that I put down for environmental control is um, if we use signal interference reduction, it's a way that we can control the signal from traveling 
beyond, right? Because we know that signals are in waves and sometimes that can impede other technology. For example, like if you are looking at MRI systems, um, I consulted quite a few health facility. So what they want a lot of the times is to make sure that some of the signal doesn't travel beyond that, including wireless. So what we, because interception of signal can jeopardize their system. So what we want is we want to implement ways to make sure that that signal is blocked or it's, it's um, actually contained uh, within a certain area. And so we talked in the network class for those of you who took it, right, about using glass, wall, water to really bounce signal. And you can also use devices to control some of that, right? Um, as you, you probably heard my example about stadiums, when you go to a live concert, they would use ways to block people from streaming from the inside and they would have they would have like a pay streaming service. Um, so when you're in there, even though you see wireless signal, you're unable to send out message because there's a boundary, right? Your, your request, when it sends it from your system, it didn't get to the destination. It will just be pending as TCP needs to confirm that you know, there's acknowledgement in the destination. So they can use jammer and, you know, uh, degrader uh, stuff like that to, you know, dissolve the signal. Any question? Military base sometimes does this too. So, okay. Um, so before we answer the next one, let's check back here. Environmental controls is on page six and also physical security is on page six. Okay, and assets, as I mentioned, is a key, right? To track your values, uh, your valuable assets. Now, assets, of course, depreciates over time, right? Like we're talking about computer equipment, not people. Um, as that would be because the use of it wear and tear, right? So most company would retire the assets after five years or sometimes three if they're more frequently used. So companies would use tag systems, right? Like you see this little barcode tag. And for most company, they would treat anything above $500 as assets or capital assets, okay? So like, a laptop that's worth more than $500 that will be considered. Now, as time spans, the assets deteriorate or depreciate. Um, when we retire that, right, we would want to track that. And when we dispose it, we wanna make sure it's properly disposed because somebody can still get our hard drive and so forth, okay? Mobile devices are a lot more difficult to track, especially bring your own device to work. Right, many companies said that you can use your smartphone for sales or stuff like that. So the ownership is, is yours, but then the company also pay for some of your service uh, on that device. So it's a little bit more difficult to track, especially with the bring your own and also with the smaller devices because people can easily lose it, okay? So now the, the area that we're going to touch on is redundancy and fault tolerance, okay? This is a, another essential area for security. Um, redundancy just means that we have to have duplication of the critical systems network. So you don't want to have only one where it becomes a, a fault, right? If somebody can, uh, can attack that server and if you only have one server, you're done. So we wanted to have failover servers, servers with plurals. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we don't just have one firewall, we have to have multiple detector, um, you know, IPS, IDS, all of that. 
And fault tolerance just mean that for the critical component that is at fault, we wanted to make sure that it's redundant, okay? So if you only have one, one line of communication, somebody can cut that line, right? They can literally go in with the wire cutter and cut that line. Um, and, and that can stop you from completing operation for that day or you will lose business. Um, so they would have a backup line and they have to protect that backup line. And with storage and backup with data is very important. A lot of companies still use RAID and it's a way that we can have multiple disk storage to store our data. Companies like transportation companies, that's essential because bus routes, train routes, uh, flight routes, right? We wanna have failover cluster of servers, uh, a group of servers that would be used when the other one get get shut down. And sometimes it could just be that the server is, you know, uh, there's not enough RAM on the server and it's malfunctioning. Sometimes that could be hardware related. It's not always going to be attacks, right? Uh, we want to have a backup power source generator or uninterrupted power supply, your UPS. Now UPS, you know that it is a, a small battery. Even on the larger UPS that costs, you know, a thousand dollars, they're just multiple batteries connected. UPS is meant to be used for only at most a couple of hours. Good enough for you to start back up and then find other ways to supplement that. Okay. Most companies, the larger one, they would invest in solar base backup power now or diesel generator. Um, where we would put gas in and then it would generate power for us. Sometimes they would share the generator with other companies that's close by. Um, like let's say I own a building for this company and I can share that generator with another company in another next building, okay? Um, they would have backup locations Hot means that it's fully operable, like different branches where people can move over to the next location to work in case of natural disaster or man-made disaster. Cold site is like empty room, maybe a chair, right? No main equipment there. A warm is a little bit of equipment, just bare bone, just good enough for us to kind of survive short time and then companies would put things on diesel 18 wheeler trucks right and they can move them into different locations so that way in the case of you know any kind of disaster or any kind of damages they can be moved around and you see this with AT&T Mobile AT&T T-Mobile Verizon a lot of communication company, they put satellite and things and networks on, on these type of trucks. Um, so for number 14, right? Some of the redundancy solutions, we wanted to have failover server clusters, generator or UPS, and then we wanted RAID. The reason why RAID is good in that it would be, it uses multiple disks, but depending on the RAID type. RAID stands for redundant array, right? Disk. So it, it's basically a group of disks that you can write across, okay? You can stripe or you can mirror And RAID technology been around for a long time. You can use RAID for home too, okay? RAID comes in hardware and software. <clears throat> Any questions with 12 through 14? So, um, 
you can find all of the fault tolerance redundancy on page seven of your notes. Single point failure, we want to avoid that. That means that one component within the system that can cause fail to, and it might cause interruption in the operation. <clears throat> Rate stands for redundant array of inexpensive disk. So the rate zero is two or more physical drives and these hard drives are made for RAID. So you have to use two or more and zero, what it does, it writes across both and it's fast, okay? So if you have three or four, sure, it will just write across all three or four. Now, in the case that, that if you have two, if one fails, you're done with rate zero. So that's not really help. It's just for performance, it's fast. It's a good way to back up data. Rate one, it copies exact data from the first disk to the second disk. It's called mirroring. It's a duplicate. Now, the downside of this is that you only have 50% capacity on both drives. If one drive fail, you can still operate with RAID 1. RAID 5, three or more disks, it stripes like RAID 0. And if two drive failed, it will cause data loss. But if one drive failed with RAID 5, it still works. RAID 6, it has what's called a parity block. This operates if you have two or more disks and RAID 6, I think it requires at least three. Um, if you have two disks fail, then you are still able to operate, okay? And parity block means it checks your data accuracy. So most organization, when they use RAID, they would have a combination. And so when you see RAID 10, it just means that it duplicates mirror and stripe, okay? And that's very common. So for 15, it asks you, what is RAID? It's redundant array of inexpensive disks, and you can expand on that using multiple disks to store data. And recommendation-wise, which RAID is recommended for a college like Moreno Valley College, that will be RAID 10, fast and duplicate. Stripe and mirror. Now they can use RAID 6, right? RAID 6 requires more disk and it does stripe across some, but it has parity block. RAID 6 tends to be more expensive. Any question with 15? So RAID information is also on page seven. And here it talks about if you have a single server that can cause disruption, that's a fault. You have power, single source that could cause problem, okay? Load balancer, all this is is to optimize and distribute data loads across different computers. So that prevents what we call bottleneck. So when you have a lot of network traffic, if it goes through one type of appliance or one system, like a router, what you will have is that router is gonna handle all of that traffic. It's kind of like having 10 lanes on the freeway going down to like two lanes, right? When they close it for construction, well, it's gonna slow down all the cars. So 
what with load balancer, what we can do is we can distribute it, okay? We can make it where it would load it to different appliances across our network, okay? Or we can load it across different multiple networks, okay? So in a traffic like detour wise, so like we can have it where instead of two lanes, we can open the other side, we can add in another lane on the other side so that way we can reroute the traffic. So um, an old way that they use it and they still do use it today, it's called round robin. Um, the way that it works is that it sends a request to each server, right? And like, think of it like a round, like a circle. And each of the server would respond and then there will be dedicated server that would send it out. Now they found that this is tend to be slower, but it's still being implemented in some networks. Okay. Okay, let's talk about backup before we answer the next question so you know. So when you create backup on your system, the first backup should always be a full backup. A full backup means everything on your system, okay? So let's say that I back up my laptop today, I would back up the image of my laptop, the operating system, the application on it, the files in it, right? Everything that's used at that stored and, and I'm utilized on that laptop. So a company would start with always a full backup of each of the system, right? Your user's computer and servers and all of that. They don't just back up servers, they back up all the system, okay? And backup is simply a copy of the data to make sure that it's available in the case that's lost, okay? Now, after the full backup, you have different schematic in the backup. You have a differential backup, which backs up all the data that has been changed since the last backup, okay? So let's say I did a full backup today and a week later, I can do a differential backup. All that is, is it's gonna check what has been different from my, my, last, my last backup, which is the full. So in the week, let's say I downloaded 30 new files. I installed two new applications. Um, you know, I, I created four new files. So those new things will be backed up to the differential. Now, in order to put everything back, right, in the case you lost data, you first have to recover from the full backup. And then you would take the differential and add to it. Then you will be current. And the recovery process is twice or more longer than backing up. Backing up is fast for most part, but the recover, because the system has to take that file as a BKAP or a different format, it's a different format and it's converting it back to your OS, your application, your files and putting everything back. I don't know if you have gone through the recovery process on your computer, but it usually takes forever, right? Compared to doing a backup that might be very short, 30 minutes, an hour, a couple hours at the most, okay? The, the incremental backup is another way. It backs up the data has been changed since the last full or the last increment. So I would need to do a full first, okay? And then I would also need to do an increment. An increment means periodic, an increment. So I can do one, the first increment on, let's say I did a full on Sunday, and then I would do an increment on a Tuesday. 
and then another increment on a Thursday, and then another one on Saturday. So the Tuesday, right, marks the first increment. So when I do the, the second increment on Thursday, it's going to only back up since the last Tuesday. Okay, so when you roll it back, when you recover, you do a full, the first increment, and then the second increment. Now increment is used because it's, it's less data that's backing up each time, but you do it when you recover, you recover it as a set, okay? And also differential is less data. We don't do a full every single time. That will just take too much storage. A lot of my former IT students, they have a hard time understanding this. And I said, uh, unless, the best way to do this is to perform it, right? You have to do it so that way you can see it. So um, as you know, I became a field technician when I first started. Um, I did a bunch of repair, install a lot of different networks. And then um, later on, before I became the system administrator and network administrator, I got a job at uh, one of the pharmaceutical company. And my job was a backup operator. Um, I liked it a lot because backup operators, a lot of the times we don't have to, you know, deal with a lot of the issues with the users. We just go in, do backup, catalog it. You have to, you know, put in, you put it on the list. You have to specify which backup is which. So in case they recover and then when they recover, usually you have to be there and you would do it at odd times, right? If you ever access websites at like, 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, sometimes you see that it's crawling slow, right? Usually they perform backup around that time. And um, when they do that, they don't take it off, right? They might take the main server off and put the backup server, the, the secondary server on. And so that secondary server might have less uh, bandwidth. It might have less capability compared to the main one because it might be cheaper. Or so when you back up, you try not to run anything else on it, right? So you can have the entirety of the data and then anything that's different that will go into the differential backup. So I used to work like super late night, but I'm nocturnal and I love it. So, um, and backup gives you the snapshot to the system. It captures the data at a certain time, right? So it takes a snapshot of the applications, the OS, the configuration, and we call that images. And so we would have that image for that system. So if I recover it, I can recover it back to the last Sunday or the, you know, and then add, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to it by using the later backup. And so that way I would have the entirety system recovered to its original state. Now, you should test it. A lot of technicians think that they just back it up and we're good, right? Nope. It's, if your backup is corrupted, right? If it's not done right, no good, okay? And um, so when I did it, they had to ship uh, these tape drive, right? They back it up onto the tape. Tape is old and then they still use it today, right? It costs like a couple dollars a tape. But now a lot of companies are doing cloud backup, hard drive backups because it's affordable. Back then they would have company, a company that would come out and pick up these tapes. Um, some companies, they would come in these uh, van, kind of like the ones that go to the ATM machine with the armed guards, right? So if you have super sensitive data, you can hire that type of service. They would protect it with guns. Uh, <laughs> they would transport it to a secure facility and they would lock it up for you. And when you need it, you call them and they would bring it to you, right? Um, so I had worked for the company that had that. They had formulas and things for pharmaceutical that, that's sensitive. And they would have a company that come and pick it up. So my job was to 
handoff and check off the catalog on what was sent, right? So we would send off the last month stuff and keep the current month in case something happens and then, and so forth, okay? So some of the consideration, uh, making sure that you clearly label, you need to put it in fireproof cabinet if you store it locally. Um, you can have it offsite, right? Like I, I would have a, a second location where I would push all my backup there and you can do it through the network too. Um, a lot of the companies, they would have data center in different countries like Facebook and they would have duplicate of the data in different countries in the case where if a certain country um, gets impacted by natural disasters or some kind of disasters. Um, and then there's some legal implications, uh, contracts. So cloud company, they can back up your data, right? And in the contract, they will say that they are liable for this percentage, okay? If they lose your data, they would only be liable for that percentage, okay? And, and that's across all organization, whether they store your data physically or, you know, they maintain your data. Um, so it's really how you review that contract. And, you know, even with the insurance company, uh, I had dealt with the insurance company for, for my, one of my clients, right? What they did was they said, oh, well, we only pay like 2% for each of the asset that you lost. So their data is worth, let's say $100, 2% of that, you do the calculation, it's very minimal. So you lost all of that money. So when we look at the plan on how we better protect it, we rather invest into something that we can back up long-term and not lose like that again, okay? So it's very business-oriented security. Okay, so for number 16, it asks you what type of backup is suitable for a small retail store that opens nine to nine, to nine Monday through Sunday, right? So for me, I felt that first rule, right, full backup. And we want to back up when the customer is not there because Right, you have to take the system off to get all the data. So I would do a full backup on at 10 p.m. on Sunday for the week to start. Okay. And then we would do a differential every day. Okay. So on Monday, now the downside in this, this is gonna, the upside is that it's gonna give you minimal cost, right? We're only gonna have one backup each day. It costs us less storage because it's such a small store, right? They're not gonna have, you know, huge money to invest into these things. Um, the downside is, let me present this to you. If something happens, on Monday at noon, okay? So I, I did a backup for the, the previous day on Sunday and at 12 o'clock, something happens, okay? And it interrupts and, and like, let's say somebody downloaded a virus and it wipes out the data, okay? Um, what will happen is when I roll the recovery, I can only, I only have the Sunday, the previous day to roll with, right? Like, okay. So I lost half of a day data because the next backup is not until the end of that day. So some companies, they would say, oh, you know, when we close for lunch at that time, we'll just schedule the backup half of a day. So we'll have the morning and then we'll do a, the second backup at the end of the day at 10 p.m., okay? So they would roll it at like, you know, at doing break time and then they can take that system up, put another system back on. And so that way they can still continue the business while they're doing the backup. So the downside in this is we might lose at most the entire day, right, uh, each time, okay? 
but it's going to be minimal cost. So there is no back perfect backup solutions unless you wanted to pour in a lot of money. So my question to you is, how often do you think Amazon backs up or companies like that, right? Where they host people's data, they have sales worldwide 24-7, right? A lot more frequent than this, right? And some companies, they do it hourly basis. They have, you know, backup running, backup of a backup of a backup. So that way they don't get into a situation where they lose transactions, they lose data, which could cost them lots of money. Because if, you know, I walk into Costco all the time and I think about if Costco shut down for an hour, because the system failure or they, it, you know, a sales terminal cannot access the database somehow that they lost the data of the products, uh, how much money would they lose, right? So in security, you have to think about that. You have to think about if this interruption happens and if I don't have the backup for that, how much money is that going to be equate to, right? And because it could be your job, it could be your boss's job, right? Or even the CEO. So because, you know, if they lost so much money, they have to shut down and, and so forth. So um, we have to think about those things when we come up with solutions. For 17, to store your backup media, like drives and tape drives, um, we wanted to make sure that we have lock cabinets or fireproof area, right? If you have a full server that stores this, right? We wanna make sure that we, we keep it away from people tampering it. And then we have some kind of fire suppression system installed there. We can even send some of the media offsite. And then we wanted to test backup periodically. So, um, as backup operator, I used to have to test it every week, right? So when I do a backup for the current week, I have to test the previous week backup. Question? Sure. So I, I, I think I heard that RCC backs up every hour or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's fair. So how, how often would you test that backup for that situation? They probably do it daily, right? Or sometime midday. They would group, a, they would take a set of the differential with the full and then they would, or increment with the full and then they would test it together. So when you test it, all you do is you do a recovery process on a test system. And some software tools are better at that than other, right? Uh, if you don't have the software tool, you have to do the full recovery to see if it works. And then you can check that off. But there are software tools for backup only. And it's really user friendly. You can select things to backup and then it will just do its thing. And then you, you, know, you would use that same software to test it. So it simulates it for you. It will tell you, oh, this, these groups of backup, it would mean this and it will present that to you. And the usual reason for uh, a failed backup is that usually hardware? Uh, sometimes. And sometimes that it could be something in on the OS side or in the file side. It could be malware, it could be a lot of different things. But yeah, majority of the times it's hardware. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Anything on backup, now you understand how to use backup, right? Because people say backup, backup all the time. And, and I think that if people know a little bit more about backup, so for personal practices, I recommend if you don't at least back up your data once a month, especially for the system that's online a lot and we use it every day for school, back it up, right? Um, a big lesson for me was when I was, I started my dissertation, uh, I think I told some of the students, I had uh, a backup <laughs> uh, sitting in my backpack 
on a, an external hard drive of the research part of my dissertation and uh, a laptop sitting in my old apartment and somebody broke into the apartment and they took all my electronics equipment. And this is on Marino Beach Drive. Um, so I had gone out and came home in a few hours and found that my apartment, everything was, you know, tattered. They took everything. And the first thing I did was I ran into the closet to see if my backpack was still there. It was one of those backpacks that I used to use for travel and it was gone because they use it to store things when they took it. And they thought that there was a laptop in there also. So they also took my laptop. And the day before I remember telling myself, I need to put this on the cloud. And I hadn't had a chance to do that. I keep putting it off. And uh, I lost all my research for years. <laughs> and so I had talked to my advisor and he said, you know what, maybe you should start fresh, which I did. And I started with a new topic and, you know, but I was super angry. I was so upset at myself for letting that happen you know, coming from, you know, my experience and what I do for a living and, uh, you know, just so crazy. So now like, I don't just back up one times, I back it up three times, cloud, right, two media all the time. And I store the media in different places, not just my house. So uh, it's, you know, big lesson learned, costs a lot of time and money um, anyway. So I re advise you to do frequent backup of your system, okay? In case it fails or something happens. Okay, uh, continuity elements. We want to continue in the case of disasters, man-made or natural disasters, uh, power outages, uh, even leak, or you know, people attack us, take our data, internal threats, stealing our data, um, stuff like that. So BCP is what's called business continuity plan. That's part of the security person job to be able to create solutions or, you know, possible solutions to implement in the case of fire, of attack, of power outages, data loss, et cetera. So we talked about backup to address some of the data loss, right? Um, talk about backup powers. We talked about protection. Um, and then we talked about, you know, physical security um, and environmental control. So all of that goes into the business continuity and statistics shows that the business that don't have business continuity plan, right, like for new businesses, they would likely fail within the first two years. Um, and, you know, they did research on this with different institute. Question? Okay. Yes. Sorry, um, asking about your experience is, um, you know how the mobile phone and the iPads, they have the that tool, find my device. Yes. Can you also do that for like the external hard drive or, you know? Uh, from my experience, like Seagate's Washington Digital, they have a manager to sync backup stuff, but it doesn't, because it doesn't have wireless signal or uh, a communication type of, uh, a com uh, feature, uh, you can't. And I had called pawn shops after pawn shops looking for my stuff and I had talked to the police for days, right? Like I said, give me back. I don't care about anything else. You can take my TV, whatever. Just give me back my drive. Um, and they probably sold it for like $10 or something. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I don't know about the newer devices now, right? But to be safe yet, put it on cloud. Now the free drive stuff that you see like Google Drive and, and OneDrive and some of that, that enter a different uh, organization property. So you have to be really careful about um, putting data into specific area on cloud, right? It doesn't always mean that it's 100% safe. They do their best to protect your data even though it's a free service, but some of the data, uh, the ownership becomes kind of grayish depending on the contract and the, the agreement in, in the usage of that service. Um, so for my research, I was a little bit skeptical about putting it in, in some of the cloud services because it's intellectual property and 
um, there's stuff that I'm going to copyright. And so that was, that was the initial thought when I, when I was shopping for the cloud backup. But going back to your question, if they have something like that, um, that will be good because it's a way that we can remotely lock it or we can find it. Um, I wish I had that. Okay. Okay. Uh, another thing that we also have to do, and this is for the, the soon-to-be analysts, if you are one, um, business impact analysis. And so when you look at the business side, right, the business analysts, they have to look at what could be impacting a uh, specific process in the business, um, or it could be, you know, if you're looking at the project, what would be impacting that project. Um, so overall, from the security side, we think about what would be the impact in the business, okay? The function, the operation of the business. So if your business is to sell t-shirt, right? What would be impacting your business? Things like if your sales terminal goes down, you can't ring up customer. If your point of sale system doesn't work, um, if your, you know, uh, if your store get caught on fire, um, you know, if your website is not functioning, um, stuff like that. So in the business continuity plan, you have to build in a business impact analysis, okay? So here I stated these questions, um, you know, think about, so my students in security, they struggle with this area a lot, like writing it, okay? So in, in the upper bachelor level classes, like at Cal State San Bernardino, they make you do this. Um, and in graduate school, they make you do this too for like security management. So you have to evaluate what's the possibility of that facility catch on fire. For us in California, that's, that's high, right? And then you rank it, low, medium, high, or most critical, medium, critical, and lowest critical, um, or lowest impacted. Possible attacks, outages, data loss. So it becomes like a matrix. Uh, so you would look at what's most critical and you would address that first, okay? You would find solution for that first and that's part of the job. Um, what would be the dependencies in those critical system and functions? That means that, you know, things like people, right? Um, when you're looking at critical system, you have to think about who's operating that system. What is that system dependent on? Internet connection, the operator, um, you know, like delivery trucks, it can't go by itself, not yet anyway, right? You have to have a delivery driver, um, stuff like that, okay? So where to start? NIST SB800 has the frame for it. So you just use their advice, right? So they give you a guidelines on, on how to write it, what to put. The government agencies, I'm working with interns for the DOD right now, and all the DOD contracted company, they have to use NIST documentation. And because, you know, verbatim, they have to implement some of that into the, that's part of the Department of Defense requirement. So, you know, NIST is a good place to start. They also have their own certifications in different area. Um, so, you know, if this is your thing, right, it's more on like the administrative side of the security world, but, you know, and then in management, a lot of the times when you get to management position, that's what you look at, okay? Okay, let's talk about some of the other terms, your recovery, okay? So there's different acronyms for different areas in security and in recovery. RTOs means recovery time objective. The maximum amount of time that it takes to restore the system. I told you earlier that it takes a long time. So let's say that we tested our backup and it usually takes on average eight hours, right? You cannot put down the average time. You have to put down the maximum time, right? Possible that it could be slow depending on, you know, the system resources, um, Etc. If you're backing up from the network and recover from the network, that could be your bandwidth too. So it's dependent on the bandwidth. So we would put down the maximum hours and minutes, right? 
that it would take to restore that system after an outage, okay? Companies would put down like, for larger enterprises, they would put like, oh, you know, hours, this many hours. Um, and then we would use that in the recovery plan. Your RPO is your recovery point objective. It's the point in time, right, where the data loss is acceptable. So earlier, our small business retail backup scheme that we came up with, right? So we have to point to which day is acceptable so that way we can still operate. So if we, if we back up on Sunday and we lost half of a day on Monday, that's okay, right? We can still, or maybe not, maybe only the first hour of the next day. Okay, so then we have to decide maybe we should back up every hour. Okay, so the recovery point and objectives really ties back to how we operate with the backup. Uh, mean time between failures, it's a measure on system reliability that's represented in average time between the failures. Okay, and this is usually on trends. Um, when we look at this is we're saying, oh, how often is our system fail and how long is it failed for, right? Like days, months, minutes, and then you determine the average, okay? So the mean time between failures. And then the mean time between recover is just the average time to restore or repair, okay? So the first time it might be that, you know, we're low on RAM. That's why our, our server fail. And that takes us an hour because we can go buy RAM and put it in, right? Or it could take two days because we have to wait for Amazon shipment on RAM and then put it in. Um, so over time, you would determine an average. And what you want to do is we wanted to reduce, right, the time. That's the goal. And some of the things here. Okay, so a big thing for security when you look at jobs is about this, right? Recovery, disaster recovery, incident response, okay? An incident could be failed system, an incident could be malware. So we want to continue operations whatever we can do there, making sure we have all the plans in place. We have another plan called disaster recovery, right? And that ties back to restore and backup. We have to come up with a plan for those things. And then we have to prepare ourselves and what these plans are for. So in the case of you know natural disaster, how do we handle it, okay? Earthquake, how do we handle it? Um, and to protect our people and our equipment. Um, in the case of fire, in the case of, you know, attacks, in the case of, you know, somebody threatened to put or put a bomb in our building, how, how are we going to handle that? So, and then after you recover and you go through the process, if that happens, you test the recovery system, and then you have to write a report saying that this is what happened. This is the process that we implemented. This is something we should have done. This is a lesson learned. <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's answer the last few questions and touch on the lab. So, 18, compare and contrast RPO and RTO. So RTO, recovery time objective, identifies the maximum amount of time that it takes to restore a system after an outage. Okay. And then RPO. Recovery point objective. It's a point in time where the data loss is acceptable. Uh, 
for 19. Compare and contrast MTBF and MTTR. For mean time between failures, it measures system reliability, presented the, represented the average or the arithmetic mean time between failures. The mean time to recover average or arithmetic mean of the time to restore a failed system or to repair that system. And security plus they do ask this if you take the test, right? And other security examination certifications also require this, including CISSP, SSCP, Okay, any questions on 18 and 19? And then lastly, number 20, uh, why is disaster recovery plan important in a business? Because disaster plan contains procedures and resources that are needed when a disaster occurs. Business relies on DRP to recover and return to daily operation. Now, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan at home, you need to make sure you do that, right? Like, I'm sure you do. You tell your children about different case scenario, right? Like, if this happens, this is what you would do. Okay, things like, you know, where do we meet if we can't meet here, if we have to evacuate? Okay, what, what do you need to grab first and where do you go? That's exactly what the businesses are doing. Okay. So they have to plan for these things. And as I mentioned earlier, the business continuity plan encompasses all of these things. Okay. And if they don't have that, they tend to fail. There's some business that survive, small businesses, but it's unpredictable, right? So we're gonna try to do a lot of prediction based on known scenarios. Nobody knew about how huge COVID would impact businesses, right? This is the first for us. And after this, because of this, we would now know how a disease, an illness can impact organizations and operations all across all different industries. And that will be written into a plan. <laughs> So this is why you see security falls under the school of business a lot. Like at Cal State San Bernardino, cybersecurity is under the school of business. When I finished my doctorate, even though it's in IT, it was under the school of business. The chair for the school of business, they sign off on my dissertation along with my committee members who are in specific areas of that discipline. I have to get a person that uh, was for biometrics because my research was in biometrics. Um, and then, you know, there's some other entity because my, my dissertation was about how to implement biometrics to for daily operations and how to really, and I test, I tested, pilot tested it, that application and, and use it. So, um, yeah. So this is why you see the marriage between IT and business. Okay, any questions? I, I have a question that's not directly related to this class. Okay. But um, like, uh, so I know people who, who got, you know, they passed the Cisco certifications or the SEC plus, they have entry level experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is, what is 
what are they missing to not to be able to get a job? Just a job in general? Um, no, I guess, you know, in the security business. So I'm going to tell you now that entry level never starts in security. Okay. Entry level starts in IT. And if you talk to all employers, all businesses, they're going to tell you the same thing. Okay. It's security is, um, is like mid-level or second level positions. Um, the reason why is some of that has to do with the human trust and understanding the operations. So the, the starting entry level jobs, they might have you do some stuff that's security, right? Like if you do a backup, that's a little bit of security, but it doesn't, you have to know IT and networking and troubleshooting well in order to get to security because as you see, everything we touch goes back to how to fix this, right? How to fix this network, how to fix this. And our, that's how we derive solutions. So this is why a lot of organization, even if for somebody that has, you know, degree in security, certification in security, and they've never worked in that industry before, they will have to likely go into some networking based job or IT related job, right? Um, at the lowest, right, let's say that somebody have a master's degree and they have a bunch of uh, certification, they can look into an analyst job because they have that level of knowledge, right? Because analyst starts with a bachelor sometimes. And, and uh, so, you know, and what does that mean? They might have to assess systems, applications, things like that. And that's a good place to start, but not everybody starts there. So for many people, if you are new to this field and you're learning it, it's it's okay to do like tech support and then and then move quickly. I told you the story about my student. He started three months as a, a network technician, move into network engineer in the last six months at that company, and then you know, and then he transitioned to the security side and he he worked under the security side for a year after that and left the company and move on. You always get recruited once you get to that level. Um, I still get recruited today, right? Like I get emails all the time about jobs and things like that because they see my resume. It's floating around in different database. I used to be a national contractor for bigger in, you know, organizations. So, um, so it's okay to start there and get your experience. But after the first year, it's going to be better, okay? So... If you have a hard time or if you know someone who have a hard time, now they have apprenticeship program and we're trying to make sure that we can, you know, network the student with the employers and, and, and have that security for the student. And all you need is the first couple of years, really. After that, you know, you are knowledgeable, you have the skills because real world practice is, you know, even though we teach you a lot of different things, once you go there and do it, it's a different animal. It's um, you know, you learn so much more. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So I, I would advise start with some part-time internship positions and use that as experience. It's just a stepping stone. And some people, they actually do a little bit of a pay cut to transition with different industry. And that's hard because you have to support family, right? Um, so what you can do is you can pick up a part-time internship and still do what you're doing. And, you know, a lot of the stuff we do is now at the school is flexible to your schedule. So you can gain some experience. And then with that, that will give you a little bit more leverage for the next interview. And remember, a lot of companies test you based on certifications, right? Like they give you that technical test before you get to the interview. They use certification questions in those. I saw the employers uh, Loma Linda Hospital, they sent me the, the list of questions to ask the apprentice. And all of those came from A plus network plus and security plus. So I looked it over and I said, sure, I think my students can do this. So, and they won't, <clears throat> so the students that score at a certain percentage, then they'll talk to the students. So, you know, our job is to train you to get to, to get to that, where you can 
communicate with the company and they hire you. So, okay. Any questions? All right. So last part. Yay. The end now, right? I'm going to miss you guys though, but I'm going to give your Saturday back. <laughs> um, and I do see some of you in my other classes, sure. But, you know, you can always reach out to me via email. And um, if you want to know my LinkedIn, it's in my Canvas profile. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. So in the case, if you lose touch with me via email, you can also send LinkedIn. A lot of the College of the Desert students, they communicate with me in LinkedIn. I have students from 10 years ago. They still communicate with me on LinkedIn. So um, it's good to know and they're successful. So they started where you were or you are now. And that's okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about the lab real quick. It's really easy. You might have looked at it already. So all you have to do is visit different websites. And I want to introduce open PGP to you. Okay. So about 10 years ago, PGP was open source. It still is, but um, Symantec, who was Norton, right? They acquired Norton, um, you know, took, bought, right? The developers and some of the source code and converted it to proprietary. So they have their own versions of PGP. And PGP stands for pretty good privacy. So when you look at the lab page, I give you a little bit of a summary in this, right? So PGP is pretty good privacy and PGP is used in email, encrypting email and file, like attachment. Um, it was freeware and open source and then some of it has changed. So you do see applications for uh, email encryption uses PGP, okay? And so <coughs> in the open PGP website, so for the lab, you're gonna go to this website. And on here, it, it tells you a little bit more about the email encryption. So you're gonna click email encryption and then you're gonna answer the questions, okay? So read the information. It's gonna ask you to identify the email application for Windows. So here's all the ones for Windows. And if you're using specifically Outlook, you can use this with it, okay? Thunderbird is uh, if you use Firefox browser on Windows environment. And Thunderbird is like the Outlook version of, of, uh, of for Firefox. And it, it, so you can use AutoCrypt. So all I wanna do is for you to identify some of the applications and list them. Here's some for Mac OS, okay. Canary Mail is very popular. Okay, uh, for the Mac world. And then your Android. And then iOS is for like iPhone and iPad. Okay. And then there's the Linux. Claws is also common. Mutt is common too. But you do see some of these <coughs> being used. So I wanted to show you some of the products and kind of learn more about it. And then if you use web-based email like Gmail, Yahoo, you know, those, you can use plugins. So these are some of the plugins. So all you have to do is identify the application and the tools for me for the number two. And then click back. And then we're gonna go back to the website. We're gonna go back, click the back arrow button. And then you're gonna click on standing the test of time. You can click learn more. Okay. 
Here it talks about how it's a non-proprietary protocol, and that's how it began, right? Um, using public key cryptography, and I want you to make note of that because in the next part, you're going to look at public key server, okay? And uh, for pretty good privacy software, it's used for encrypting messages, signatures, certificates, and exchanging public keys. So it's equipped with all of that, okay? So here it gives you a little bit of background on open PGP. So answer the question once you read that. Then I'm going to have you go to newgp or newpg.org. And so here it talks about this is an implementation of open PGP standard. It's also used for encryption and digital signature. Okay. And this is more for development end, right? Like libraries you can use to put in write software. Um, so there's some front end applications and then the libraries that you can implement. Okay, so I wanna share this with you in case you're curious. I wanted to know on how to use some of these resources for development, okay? Now this works with LDAP too. LDAP is for you know Active Directory and Windows, and then use it for Ubuntu Phone, different things. So they have templates and resources here. So once you visit this page for number five, just tell me the functionality of it, what it is. Okay. Then step six, you are going to go to this website, ROSDE. Okay. And here's the main page. Uh, you can look into different areas. Very interesting if you read this part and it talks about the history of it, um, how PGP was created, what it's used for, pretty good privacy. And you can also look into different areas of it if you're curious. But for the lab, we're gonna click on public key servers. So there are these servers that people can enroll their public key or add it to the database, okay? And they can use it to share, they can use it to, you know, it's a repository of keys, okay? So here it talks about that. So once you go to ROSDE, then you click on public key servers link, then you're gonna go through and answer the question. What is a public key server? Can a person find someone else's public key on the server? Like if I'm looking for your key, can I find it on there? What protocols are used for a single key? And it talks about it on, on the public key server page. How do you find someone else's public key? Is it authentic? Can, how can the key be authentic, right? So if a user does this, can an attacker do it too? Sure, right? Because it's public information. So. So I want you to be aware of that. This is the service, a resource for the people, okay? So here it talks about all of that. Read this section, going down a little bit further, it talks about that too, and answer the question. It's very interesting. So if you can learn more about how keys are distributed, right? Known keys are enrolled into these systems. Here it talks about how to upload a key, okay? So a public key is not meant to be private. So that this is why public key servers exist, right? It's not meant to be secret, okay? Now, if you need to exchange key that's secret, 
then you have to have an encrypted session to communicate as we talked about earlier. Okay, so as you read through that, you should be able to answer the questions in number seven. Once you're done, save it, upload the document so I can grade it. This needs to be done by Tuesday. Okay, I know I'm pushy about assignments completed, but I have a deadline for the class, like it cannot be open after a certain period, right? Supposedly after today, but I had extended it for Tuesday and they don't let me extend anymore. My grade needs to go up by Thursday. So um, I hope to have everything by the evening of Tuesday. And then Wednesday, I finish out all your grade and post your grade. I have to send RCCD, um, you know, list of grade, I can't just do it automatically in WebAdvisor because they're still adjusting their system to non-credit courses. So um, if you have questions or challenges seeing your stuff, right? I know that there's questions about it showing up on the schedule instead of the transcript. I think what it is is because the semester is not over yet. Once it's over, it's gonna convert it into transcript listings, okay? Any questions regarding week four lab? Okay. So first and foremost, I wanna thank the interpreters, right? They've been really wonderful helping our students. And I wanna thank you guys for a really cool Saturday. It goes by so fast. Um, and yeah, please feel free to contact me. And if you have questions or if you're interested about certain classes, non-credit or credit, I'm open ears. And I hope you have a good Saturday and the rest of the semester. Do well, be safe. And type your name into the chat if you like. Bye. Um, quick question about the certificate. Yes. Um, if we did, if we complete completed and passed all three classes, uh, will we just expect the certificate in the mail? No, you have to request them to send it. And um, okay. so you need to contact student services or uh, you can talk to the non-credit on the website. I Send me an email, I'll send you the link. But they don't mail anything unless you um, petition, that's what they call it. So that way they won't mail it to you. But if you if you want it just, it should show on the transcript after the semester or after this class okay. goes in, okay? That's what so they told me. on the transcript, on the yeah. transcript, it'll still show up that we completed it, right? Yeah, it would say credit pass for these classes and then mm. completion for the certificate if you fulfill all the classes. It will say the certificate name, computer maintenance and security. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, this Nielsen said he has a question. Okay. Um, so I was just, I think I missed what you're saying. So um, are you gonna be doing the security like certification or um, I, I was I, I was trying to pay attention to what, what the other was saying. About yeah, so, so the, stu the students that took all these three courses get a, a college certificate called computer maintenance and security, non-credit. And if they wanted to take industry certification, security plus, we can uh, give them some resources on how to do that. I'm working on getting some, um, you know, exam prep, possibly some testing access, but you know, I can't guarantee that they would allow it because we can't get vouchers for students, but if I can get the license for it, I will let everybody know. Okay. Um, if you wanted to take the extended version of this class, CIS 27, I'm teaching it online in spring. It has the majority component of this and more. And other classes, let me know. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome.
Bye, take care. Take Thank care. you. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Have a good one. Take care. Bye, teacher. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Have a good one. Thank you. Uh, hey, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, I have a background with SQL database management and um, basically creating reports from raw data for users ad hoc. And mm -hmm. so I was wondering what would be a pretty good um, complement to that in terms of programming languages. So like, would it be like, what would be typically used for um, creating a BI? Would that be like C sharp or C++ or? Java. <laughs> Java. Um, yeah, well, any any language you can use with database, though, right? Like even web languages, because you see some stuff that's web based that's coming with JavaScript, using JS node with PHP, you know, so, um, but for application wise, you do see um, ICC sharp for Windows. Um, that's Microsoft is C sharp. Um, and then you have Objective C for iOS, but you know, for as far as SQL goes, SQL is its own thing. But to really tie that into some of the languages, yeah, you can use you can learn Java. Um, but the way they teach Java here is like you know, just like any programming language courses like C plus plus or Python. It's you know, starting from scratch all the way through, and in CIS uh, 18C. Um, I know Castellero, she makes the student put database to the application. So that's when you see it, when you learn the data structure. Um, but when they teach C++, like 17C, they teach it with the data structure to the internal application. They don't have it tied to the database. 17B might have it, but it doesn't, some faculty don't really put it, require like, SQL or, you know, so, but I know that the CIS 18C, which is Java, you know, the third Java class, um, it has SQL component. So if you want, you can learn it. Java is a little bit different than C++ because it starts with class. Um, and you do see companies using quite a bit of Java, like for Android development, stuff like that, um, you know. But let's see, I mean, as far as interface goes, you can use any language and any language you can tie it back to, to database. So um, have you thought about, so are you working right now in that position or? Uh, no, I'm actually going back to school for engineering, but okay. um, I just wanted to, you know, strengthen that a little bit more so it's easier when I re-enter the workforce. Yeah, RCCD doesn't have a lot of database classes that's hardcore. Um, unfortunately, when I looked at the catalog and the list, they have CIS 61, which is like database, but in the course outline of record, it uses access. <laughs> um, you know, so... Um, as far as administration goes, you know, you if you do go to the university level, they 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 emphasize more in different areas of the database. But um, yeah, if you do go for engineering, that would be good. But it's that's a different area. Right. Yeah. I know they're they're not really related, but um, it's just kind of like a little bit of like a two prong attack I've got going on here. So. Um, yeah, just kind of curious, like I said, which one's like yeah. more commonly so used. I, I don't, you might, so as, as a community college student, you can also take other online classes in other colleges because we participate in the California, you know, distance education list. So you can Right, find I'm that. actually taking Valley College classes in, concurrently yeah. to this too, so. Yeah, so you might, you might find, uh, but if you want to expand your skill on, on, on SQL, you because there's different product, right? There's MySQL, Microsoft SQL, and then Oracle. Right. Yeah. So um, 
companies sometimes uses Oracle, but you often see MySQL and Microsoft SQL being used because the majority of the people either use free products or Microsoft products. So you're welcome, Jan. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I, you know, if you wanted to add other areas, you can learn, you know, NoSQL and, and um, other things, but I would do it because you have the experience. I would do it as like a certificate or some kind of boot camp classes, do it quick and sweet and, you know, stuff like that. Um, because you're not pursuing any further in that area, you already have the experience. Um, and then if you want to learn programming languages, the closest we have, I would say, is the Java class. <laughs> Got it. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good one. You too. Yeah. All right. You guys take care. Enjoy.